or the town could keep the recs and then um, be able to say that they were using renewable power. Um, so if this, the project owner keeps the recs, then the town would not be able to say that it was using renewable power from the project, um, but that would mean that you would be buying the power at a higher price because the um, project owner wouldn't be able to sell those recs for additional revenue elsewhere. Um, and when we started down the road of this RFP, we hadn't received any guidance from the town on whether or not we should prioritize saving the most possible money or greening the town's renewable supply. So what we did is we asked for proposals that provided prices where the project owner kept the recs or the recs were uh, transferred to the town. Um, and what we found is that the cost to the town of keeping the recs is about $25,000 a year. So that would take the savings, the annual savings from 75,000 down to 50,000 if the town were to keep the recs. So this is, a, this is we're basically coming to you guys for guidance on this because this is a, a pretty big decision. And different towns deal with this differently. Um, some towns like South Portland and Portland have made commitments to reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so for some of their projects, they need to keep the recs to meet those um, goals. Other towns like Falmouth are trying to maximize their savings. And so they're letting the project sponsor keep the recs. So there's actually differing views amongst our committee on which is the best way to go um, as well. Um, there's definitely pros and cons either way. Um, and so that's why we're coming to you guys to ask about this. And I think Sam will cover later in the presentation, but which way we go on this issue um, changes which projects we would put on our short list because some of the um, uh, proposals have better or worse pricing around the recs. I don't know if anyone Jamie, wants to add anything. I would Jamie, just... Jamie, can we ask questions now or do you yeah, want to that's... wait? Yeah, okay. that's fine. Yep. Okay. I don't Go like ahead. to break the rules right out of the chute, you know? Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, no, I think especially the... if we're trying to clarify the information too. Right. So. Yep. Okay, cool. Go ahead. Um, does the value of the rec change at all or are they static once the project is implemented? No, the value actually changes all the time. So um, there is a, 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 it's basically a bilateral market where you can sell recs in, um, in New England. So the recs that are generated from this project would qualify for the renewable portfolio standards in all the New England states. Um, mm -hmm. And the other states actually have higher values put on their mm -hmm. recs than in Maine. So um, the it, it actually, Cape Elizabeth could sell the recs if you later on, if you wanted to, um, if you went with the town keeping the recs option. But so the value changes over time and it fluctuates depending on so, supply and demand um, in that market. Can you give me just a feel for, because I don't deal in this realm, I kind of sell heads of lettuce, which are more static than wrecks, I guess. Um, what would a value be? I, what are we talking about? So, I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the value of, of uh, a class one wreck like this is, it could be between zero, it's never zero, because there's a banking mechanism. So it, it could go as low as $10 a megawatt hour. And it could go as high as, I can't remember exactly what the alternative compliance payment level is, but there's a cap on the market because um, the, the entities that have to uh, comply, they can pay this alternative compliance payment. And so that's probably around $60 a megawatt hours. I, I think it might be up to 70 now, but anyway, there's a range. And so it's between those two points 
I think now the prices are actually somewhere around $40 a megawatt hour last time I checked. But mm -hmm. within the last couple of years, they've been down at 10 and they've, they've, um, they could go higher soon. So what, it does, what, they do fluctuate a fair amount, but it's kind of in, between. What average. influences their fluctuation? It's mostly it's supply and demand in the marketplace. So it's, it's a, it's an interesting market because it's, um, not that, it's not that fluid, but so, um, uh, and a lot of a lot of supply is through long-term contracts through uh, like there's a big RFP out in Maine that's going to bring a bunch of supply on. But uh, some of those offshore wind projects that we're expecting in Massachusetts, those are going to bring a big chunk of of rec supply. So um, it's it's just a little chunky, and um, and sometimes and it's if 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 you get if there's an oversupply situation, it would it take a little while to even out, and then the prices will go down. If there's undersupply, these projects take several years to come online. The market's not really enough to bring them, so the projects need financing and and long-term contracts to get that, and that can kind of slow down um, supply catching up with demand, and so you might have high prices for a while. Um, What's What's the trend looking like? Is the trend looking that um, um, supply will continue to increase? Um, or <laughs> that's, 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 a, that's a big question. I think that if the offshore wind projects that have been contracted um, by some, some of the Southern New England states, if those projects are to, um, to be successful in getting their permits, um, which there's been some delays, um, but mm -hmm. if those projects are successful in getting their permits, so states are being really active in contracting for supply. And so it will probably, I wouldn't expect us to have a shortage. So you'd be sort of in the 10 to. Add, added to that, um, the um, the smart market, the, the uh, the Massachusetts market just doubled their capacity or their allocation from 1,600 megawatts to 3,200 megawatts. And we don't know what the local influence will be because if you take the, um, the load, which is what uh, the first jump off for the um, net energy billing load is gonna be 10% of load plus the auction, you could see as much as a thousand more megawatts hitting the system in the next couple of years uh, locally, and that might influence the, disrupt the supply side as well. So uh, it, it, it's also a long run of the, over the life of this project. It's a dynamic market. The buyers are people who need to fill, either want mm -hmm. or are required to buy renewable energy. And so mm -hmm. as re more renewable energy is available, the requirements often are raised by the, uh, by, you know, by the people who regulate them. It's on my, can I make okay. a couple of comments about this? And I've had a lot of experience in these kind of markets, both in the US and internationally. So there's no question more renewable energy is coming. There will be more supply. So I think, you know, my, my personal view is high green certificate price is not likely. I think the real issue for the town is if the town decides to keep the green certificates to say that it's in the greenest position and keeping um, and just keep those and shall we say retire them and never take the monetary benefit will reduce savings. If the town is thinking that, gee, may we hold on to them, but if the certificates go through the roof, we could sell them and make more money. It's a speculative market. It's also a market created by regulation. So I wouldn't be thinking about this as a money-making opportunity. And the third thing about it is if you have, if the sponsor keeps the racks, the town is still going to buy the electricity at a fixed price that it's lower and the risk that the racks aren't worth an, more then yeah. belong to the sponsor or developer that, of the project and not the town. That, yeah, was my next, that, that was my next question because if the uh, sponsor owner of the project is the one who's holding the wrecks and the price is is down that's that puts the town in a better uh position correct it's yeah, their I, problem. I, 
I it's think, their problem. Exactly. Thank you. You answered my yeah, question. Where I, I think Tom's, Tom's really right. It's really um, the question we're asking um, the council is really a philosophical question about whether or not the town wants to um, reduce emissions from power it uses or it wants to save more money. I mean, that's that's the that's the question. Um, but I think that I, I really, I think Tom's point is the point that I was getting at is who's going to own the, the fluctuation. And if the owner of the project owns that fluctuation, then I think it puts the town in a better position. So that's just my opinion, but I'll let other people kind of go if, on to that. If I could jump in, Jeremy Gabrielson, you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I, I'm just trying to figure out uh, to, you know, so $25,000 a year over the life of a seven year project is a lot of money. Um, and so, I'm, I, you know, aside from the issue of whether or not the town may or may not be able to resell them later, um, you know, what, what would we be buying essentially for $25,000 a year? We're not in a position where we are required to purchase recs. Um, so, so what's the, what, what's the value that we would be purchasing? I guess. Carrie, can I jump in on this first and then you follow sure. up? Sure. Yep. And, and one thing I also wanted to say in the middle of this, if, if the town were to exercise one of the options after seven, 10 or 20 years or 15 years to buy the project, the town would then own the recs and can keep it. So you could also look at this as a seven year issue. If the town wanted to exercise the option and buy the project out and own it in its own seven years from now or 10 years from now. So just keep that in mind. So the, what the town, what the recs provide is the town can say the electricity it's purchasing is green because legally speaking, to say you're having green electricity, you have to be the owner of the RECs. So if the town's not the owner of the RECs, what the town is, they can say, we've got landfill, we've got a solar project on the landfill. It says we, we are reducing our electricity bill, but we can't say we have green electricity and, reduce, and are reducing our carbon footprint, even though that project on the landfill will be displacing some kind of carbon generated electricity somewhere else in New England. Mm -hmm. But you just can't claim the rights to say that we've got green electricity for the town. Yeah, and some, some towns have decided that they want to reduce carbon. It's something that they're doing. So like Portland and South Portland have, have taken some actions in that direction. And so that, that decision changes how they would look at this decision. Cape Elizabeth hasn't made any carbon reduction goals that, that we're aware of, but if you were, then this is, you know, if the town did have those goals, that would be, you would need to keep the recs. So um, it's kind of a philosophical question. Yeah. One of the key is issues is if you're building a solar project, people are going to expect that you're building green power. And if you're not, you need to be really clear and transparent about that, because otherwise you're, you, you may find yourself in a difficult, misunderstood spot. So that's between the communication and the philosophical approach, those are the, those are the issues that you're managing. I think one way to look at it that might help clarify it a little bit, if we turned to Matthew, if we turn to slides 11 and 12, So slide 11, um, no, go, go up one slide, you're on slide 12, that, uh, no, keep, that one, okay. Starting there, if you look at the blue bars represent bids that we received where the recs are kept by the town, and this expresses over the 20 year life, the average annual savings the town would expect. Um, and the yellow bars are savings that the town would get if the town keeps the recs. And that simply shows it on an average annual basis over 20 years. The next slide 
is the net present value of the savings over 20 years. So it's the same thing, but saying what's your total savings worth today and in finance terms at a discount rate of I think eight, what a 5% or something we use. And so that's again shows really the, the cost of the rec. So if you look at the upper bids, you know, the town is saving on a net present value basis over a million a year from the better higher bids, but that would be you'd be saving over 20 years. 200,000 foot claim the green. And that's the real, that's the real economics that you're looking at. And the halfway, the halfway ground is, is on the ones where the recs go to the sponsors. If you buy it out at seven years, the, the economics don't change a, a lot, partly because the town's money is relatively low cost for long-term projects. Um, so the net present value wouldn't change that much and the recs would then return to the town after that period. So it's sort of a midway choice point. Councilor Straw? I, so I, I, I want to say one thing about the savings. This is calculated in a standard way and it says, what would we pay CMP right now at the CMP tariff and how that's usually increases over time. And if the CMP tariff goes up even more, we would save more. If it doesn't go up as much, we would save less. The calculation is a pretty standard calculation used across the industry to determine likely savings. So I just wanted to thank you all for this. This is phenomenal work. This is probably the best presentation I've seen from a subcommittee, um, just content wise. And I've seen some good ones, but this is phenomenal. So thank you all for, for all your hard work on this. I just wanted to reiterate a point and make sure I'm understanding this because I think it, for me at least, it sums up exactly the direction I'd end up going. So at this point in time, the town of Cape Elizabeth does not have a policy, to my understanding, uh, or a mandate of any sort saying that we have set a goal to be 100% renewable in the next one, three, or five years. We, we have nothing along those lines, not even anything saying we want to be 50% renewable. So we don't have a policy uh, that we're moving towards renewable uh, sources for energy use. Um, I, I understand that some people in town may want us to do that, and I understand some counselors may want us to do that, and some members of the committee may want us to do that, but at, at this point in time, we don't have that policy. Um, but what we've seen, what the presentation here is saying is, to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, from a fiscal standpoint, the town will get a, uh, a better return if they uh, give the recs to the sponsor. Um, under our expectation is that with the understanding that there is a, a level of variability, there's a level of unknown. So there's a risk, things could go way up. So the recs are very valuable, but they could go down as more things come online. So whoever holds the recs is taking on a risk. Uh, but that risk only really applies from the town's perspective if it is choosing to sell them rather than hold on to them so that we can have the badge of honor of we're whatever percentage renewable powered. So for me it sounds like this is the key point. We can not make a decision on the, renew, uh, the badge of honor renewable power right now. We can go the route of leave them with the sponsor and take the net savings to the town from a fiscal standpoint with the understanding at the seven year mark we can acquire this entire project, at which point the recs come back to us. So we could set a policy saying we want to be 50, 75% renewable in seven years. And when we acquire the project with one fell swoop, we're suddenly now meeting our renewable goal. Given the fact that there is no renewable goal right now, um, my inclination is for us not to hold on to the recs and look at that seven year mark as our opportunity to kind of uh, flip the switch, so to speak, and say now we are and in the meantime, also have the fiscal benefits to the taxpayers in the short term. Yeah, I think, Chris, Thanks, I think Chris. your understanding of, of what we've presented is, is spot on. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I think everything We, we exactly wanted to make sure that. everyone understood the choices that you, we we didn't want to make those choices as the committee. We wanted you to understand what the choices are. And you it seem like you've got it. Yep. Yeah, you guys did a great job of presenting it. So uh, and, uh, although I am curious to hear if the inclination, uh, 
it sounds like there was a disparate views on the committee. I would be curious to hear if they were driven by the fiscal uh, variability or if it was there was a feeling amongst some members of the community of, oh, we really would love to be energy uh, renewable at this point. I would say that's exactly it. So yeah, it's, yeah, no, I, I, I as, as someone who hoped that we would get to keep the recs, um, I, <laughs> I would, I would, it's it's all driven by the desire to see um, see us become more environmentally responsible. Um, uh, my my particular view is just basically driven by the mission that I felt we had in our committee. Um, we were not on purpose, I assume, a renewable energy committee. We were we were designated as an energy committee, and uh, if you said we are a renewable energy committee, I might have uh, thought a different way uh, about that maybe. I think it's um, I think it's important for the you to understand that the capacity that we're currently looking at is two thirds of the town current town capacity, so that if we um, don't ever keep the recs, then the most we could you know the most we could and then in the future want to go so, so a certain percentage of of, uh, of renewable energy, you know we'd have to have you know we'd be losing two thirds of those of that opportunity. Basically, we're looking at two thirds uh, for this project. It's consuming about addressing about two thirds of the of the town current usage. So that's the quantity of the recs that we're we're talking about total. Amount. And it would be, I guess, in my view, uh, as another person on the committee was, given the fiscal constraints and everything that's going on right now, saving money felt more important. Um, as Joe and others had said, there's an ability to change that at the buyout options in the future so you can bring the recs back and and i think the i think the third thing is some of this you know it can it can it can it can get confusing and i think you know for image for the town i think people say well you entered into ppa you're selling you're saving energy costs and you put solar panels on the landfill and i think that for a lot of people in town that will be sufficiently green for the time being so <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to follow up on that, Tom, and ask either you or John that question, because, John, you had mentioned sort of the delicate, you know, dance from a communications perspective on that. And I, I, under, I, I think I understand what you're talking about. So, you know, it's the difference between saying sort of the town is renewably powered versus, you know, the town has made an overall contribution to you know, the betterment of renewable energy use, just not necessarily here in town, right? So, yes. So people sort of expect that you're going to have green energy when you put in a solar project. But honestly, it's just like we bought our energy from a lower cost bulk provider some, somewhere else. And there's no renewable impact whatsoever of putting that on there, except the fact that our land use for our landfill is probably optimized environmentally until such point as you buy it back. The other thing is this discussion about what to do about the-, the Right, the but somebody, if, if I could just jump in, somebody's buying it though, right? So it's being produced and somebody's buying it. Correct. So that, I mean, in, in the massive macro global picture, that that is a net positive, right? Correct. Except they paid that, uh, they paid us for that. That's why the cost, there's a cost difference. Right. The other thing I to consider. The other thing to consider also is all I'm saying is that it's not without environmental benefit. Is the no, point? No, I think I think I think the way to look at it is that the the mm -hmm. town, you know, citing citing renewable energy projects is quite challenging, and so for by providing a site for the project, the town is making a a, a good contribution, um, and the, the distinction maybe is that the the overall amount of renewable energy may not be higher because there's all these policy goals and the the um, the project owner is going to use those recs to meet those goals. If the town were to retain the recs and retire them, they wouldn't be going to meet the goals and so some other project would be required. So that's also, the only difference. Also, look, the, the other thing that we're sort of, we're not overlooking is we will have solar panels on a landfill that we can all go out and look at, okay? 
So if somebody tells you you don't have renewable energy, okay, I get it. But when you show people from out of town or when somebody goes to the landfill and say, look, we've got a solar project sitting on our landfill, I think that's very big. It's a big billboard. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> yeah. it, it, it may be that seeing the project on the landfill would inspire other people in town to right. put solar on, on their houses. John, and then, that, yeah, go ahead, John. I think the other thing that happened is this project came up relatively quickly. Um, and it's good because it's a really good project. But it really sort of happened in advance of thinking through, does the town want to have an environmental and or green energy or some sort of policy around that? And how, what would that look like um, were it, you know, because I, I do think that's actually probably a good idea. There'll be other decisions that will help guide you on that. Um, and you want to get input from people to see how they feel. And there's a lot of places that have that. And so this is happening in advance of having done that work. And so there's a, there was a cautiousness, as, as uh, Richard said, of tying up uh, the two thirds of the demand um, for a significant period of time before having that discussion. Could we um, keep the recs now and sell them later? If the town decides they don't want to be green after we do the analysis? That, that you could do that bar, but then, you know. No, it's, it's not ideal. Definitely not. No. Ideal. And then the town has to become the seller of the recs. Right. Manage that process. Um, as opposed to um, the the sponsor, all of these guys have entities that manage and do this. Right. So we have to acquire expertise to sell the recs. Yeah. And and, this, and, and you would and now you're taking on the risk too, which you right. don't have to otherwise. Right. Gary, perhaps it'd be interesting if you explained who typically buys recs. Who buys recs? Um, so the um, anyone it load serving entities who have to comply with the RPS. So um, in Maine, that's the like the standard offer program or any of the retail um, retail suppliers. CMP, Amera. Yeah, so it's, well, that's what's CMP you get if you're on the standard offer program. It's actually the PUC who does the compliance. But basically, just imagine it was CMP, the people who are getting you your power. Um, or if you were to sign up for um, like uh, what was that company that was advertising all the time? Electricity Maine. They would have to provide some percentage of renewable power and then some percentage of, you know, whatever gas generation or. Um. So what are the what are the uh, like what is the probability that the town would want to buy the project in seven years? Like I don't know the what the cost would be. Um, if money is tight now, it could be tighter in seven years. So we might not want to have the money to buy it. So generally speaking, municipal bond rates are lower than the, the, the discount rate in the NPV calculations. So for the, uh, the rule of thumb, it's going to be not much difference or net positive because you're going to be able to use lower cost money on a, on a cash flow positive long term project. Well, the point also is, John, and, and uh, it, it's it's also that we it will be an option among certain uh, uh, vendors. They're offering us an option. You take the option, you don't take the option. The option doesn't cost us anything. We know what, what the buyout yep. will be at that particular time, which right. they'll see in the next slides. From a financial point of view, you'd be swapping a bond payment for a PPA payment. Right. Well, that's, yeah. that's what the difference would look like, of a, a bond payment and a maintenance contract mm -hmm. payment. Um, Councilor so, Straw, Councilor Straw next, and then I, I, I after after Chris uh, comments and maybe requires an answer, I, I want to jump in to um, just sort of manage our time a little bit here. So Chris, go ahead, and if, if you need an answer for what you're saying or asking, we'll get to that, and then I want to come back around to uh, just driving the meeting a little bit. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm, uh, I think it's highly, highly, highly unlikely I'd be on the town Council in seven years, but what I would look to have the council do over the next half year in conjunction with this is set a, a long term goal of uh, becoming more energy uh, independent with renewable energy, uh, perhaps setting it at the seven year mark with the goal of yes, we're doing this now so that the tax credits can be used by the private entity, but at the seven year mark we acquire it. But obviously, the current town council can't bind future town councils to doing things. Um, although I guess there's 
who knows what the future town councils will do. Um, but uh, I would be interested in setting a long-term goal, but I would set it at the seven-year mark. Okay. Um, I want to, so, so this has been great discussion, um, and I, I echo Chris's point earlier, and I'm sure speak for the rest of the council. The, the analysis and information here is incredible. Um, I want to keep us focused, uh, especially mindful of a, a second agenda item that we have tonight. And that is, you know, Sam, maybe you can pull us back to discussion around the things that require decisioning or, or at the very least direction from the council tonight uh, or in the near term. Um, and I, sort of a, a, an overall timing around some of these things uh, so that we can have a better understanding of how to move forward. And I, I know that there's also the item that you've raised in both your, in, in your memo um, around one of the specific bidders and, and uh, relationship with one of the, the committee members as well. So I want to make sure we have time to cover all of that um, um, and give that enough discussion for now. So That's great. Yeah, that seems perfect. And I'm mean, glad you were able to uh, come re respond and, and uh, kind of digest our, our, you know, our thoughts on the, the, the rec issue. I think it's really important. And thank you for your direction on that. Um, so the, the second kind of you know, issue we want to bring in front of you was the, the conflict of interest potential COI. Um, one of our, our, our committee members, um, Tom Murley, who you, you, you've heard. Um, Tom, we you describe kind of your role with MRESCO and kind of your, um, uh, kind of, you know, your, your perspective you know, on this? Yeah, just really simple. So Amoresco is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. I've been a member of their board of directors for four years, and I've known the founder uh, uh, of the company for over 25 years, which is why I was asked to join the board. Amoresco is the largest energy efficiency company in America, and their core business is, you know, improving energy efficiency of schools, municipalities, universities, hospitals, and the like. But they also do small scale solar projects if you've driven out along the mass pike and seen the solar projects at the various toll plazas of the mass pike that's amoresco so they are new england based they're a leading company um, and this is one of the small sizes they don't do the big projects this is the kind of thing they like to do and they have lots of landfill experience so that's kind of the company i've been on their board for four years um, i've disclosed the conflict from the beginning um, in Amoresco's size, you know, they make over, they have $900 million a year in revenue. Frankly, doing this project or do, not doing the project doesn't move the needle for them economically. I receive a normal stipend for being a member of the board. I receive no additional compensation if they do this or don't do this. And it's so small in the relative to the bit of the board that Amoresco's, I would never vote on this decision to do or not do the deal because it will never come to the board of Amoresco because it's too small an ordinary course of business. Um, but you know, they are an experienced company. I'll let you know, Sam and some other people talk about them. But I've disclosed the conflict. You know, they've come in, they have a bit, they're a bidder, and they're a bidder that, you know, by the numbers probably should be shortlisted. But we wanted to make sure that people were aware of the conflict and that I haven't voted on it and particularly wouldn't vote in any final decision on awarding either about Amoresco. But maybe Sam, you can say something about Amoresco because you know them, Sam Lipman, um, about whether these guys should or should not be on the short list, regardless of my conflict. Oh, um, well, we have them in, we have them on the short list, but maybe not the highest highest grade based on um, the numbers that they put out. We, you and I, talked about this, Tom, um, but of course they are by far and away probably the most stable company uh, in the, in the uh, from an experience point of view and from a financial point of view. So we, uh, by the way, um, I'm going to regress a little bit, Tom uh, and the rest of us, but Tom really worked hard on putting up a rating system. Sam, are you going to be showing that rating system at all in this? I forgot. That's the last three slides. Okay. So I will, I won't elaborate. And, and so I don't have to comment too much about why Amoresco is where they are. Amoresco scored quite high on, on, on some of these ratings uh, that we put together and on others they were lower than others. So it was a cumulative rating system that we used 
to to put Amoresco in a certain place and 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 recommend them for the shortlist. And I really don't have to say any more about that because we put a lot of effort into it, Tom. Uh, you put an awful lot of effort in, into into getting the rating right, or and and we all kind of commented on that as well. Yeah, and we just want to make sure that that the count the council was aware of that and just effort of being fully transparent. So that was the, the the purpose of that agenda item. Um, okay. Um, so can you? Can you help me understand um, what I guess what what role Tom you you've had in in assigning the scoring here or just coming up with so, so you as a committee member were were you more involved in developing the ranking methodology and then or help walk me through that so that because well, I think I think actually I, I think we're in a situation where um, this probably is a conflict of interest or at least a perceived one um, that we probably the, the the toothpaste is a little bit out of the tube already on this it's given the discussion we've already had and the work that's already gone into this and it, it's one of these difficult things where your expertise is hugely valued on this no question about it um, but um, to the average person, I think, you know, th there there would certainly be at the very least some question about yeah. about this. So, so yeah. what so what we did is taking all the bids. The the first thing we did was build a model that took all the inputs of the bids. I can send the model around. Um, mm -hmm. It's crazy, but to model all these variants and calculate the savings, and that was done for everyone on the same basis. So we took all that and that's where you get the, you know, the savings data. And there's a whole bunch of other analysis we haven't shared with you. And um, everyone in the, on the teams look at it. Richard Parker has been particularly good at looking at the model and checking methodology and making sure all the calculations are correct. It's, it's a big Excel spreadsheet. And then having taken that, we, um, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna open mine up here for a minute. Um, um, we, no, that's not it. We then, we then created a ranking system and I just need to open this up. Um, and we scored everyone, um, as objectively as we could. Um, there it is. Okay. So in the, in the, the ranking... Sorry. Yeah, the ranking scale came out of the consensus of basically how we put together the RFP because the RFP right. was sort of what we were going to be evaluating. And then we took that and put it into a rating scale sort of as a group, as a consensus. And so everything was sort of put together as that the, the group decision. It was not driven by any one member whatsoever. So on the ranking, what we did just going across it, we, we weighted this, you know, 60% of the weighting went to how much money are you saving the town? So everyone was rated one to 10 based on the amount of the And that's savings. an objective number. That's, there's no subjectivity that's to that. That's an objective number. That's 60% of the weighting. And then there's a similar weighting one to 10 based on the production. So how many, which is kind of a subset of savings, but how much electricity is going to be produced. There's a weighting of 5% on what it costs to build it, who is more efficient in their capital program. We then weighted at various levels their experience in doing landfill. Um, you know, Amoresco has done a lot of landfill. Some of the other bidders have not done much landfill. Uh, we did a rating on financial ability. Clearly, Amoresco is a big company. Company comes out very high on that. The other ones, though, are actually pretty high. We gave a small ranking as to whether or not people had a main office. Some of them do, some of them don't. We gave another ranking on experience on building in Maine. Um, again, these would have been done kind of on a one to 10 rating. Um, and then um, there are a couple other things. Um, you know, if, if with the town wanted to get more electricity, would they offer us a project outside the town to top up the town's electricity need? And then, and some offered that, some didn't. Uh, cost savings. So there's one of the things we put in was if it cost them less to build this, would they share some of the savings with the town in terms of reduced PPA price? 
Some people were more willing to do that than others. And then we also put a ranking, a small weighting on how quickly they could get it into the ground. And, you know, we can share that ranking, but then everyone was put in on trying to be as objective of that, as objective as possible. But the big driver on that really is the, the production, the CapEx, and the, the price savings, which are pretty objective in the ranking. So did each member of the committee do their own scoring and then that was aggregated or? What I did is I put together a score, I put together the scoring and I've sent it around to people and we've talked about it at the meetings and we've talked about whether the weightings are correct in the scoring. So everyone's looked at it. Yeah. Um, and we, we went through the savings calculations in detail as well. So the, it's like the, those, the objective criteria, which actually kind of tend to dominate the rating system, which is the, yeah. the savings and the production and the CapEx, um, which we were sort of all in agreement with, those are pretty black and white and were yeah, reviewed by every, the calculation reviewed by everybody. Yeah, the we ones that are softer, the terms. ones that are right. softer and a little bit more subjective have to do with experience with landfills, experience in main right. projects, you know, things of that sort. But yeah. so I, I don't think those made any determinations in the final list yeah. at all, really. They're all yeah. pretty close. Yeah. Savings, production, and capex were seventy five percent of the scoring system. Yeah. And by the way, so, another thing that was really important, uh, Councilman, is that yep. is that when we looked at the reason why we asked them for their capex figures and for some of their production figures, um, and I was particularly interested in that, is is I looked at this from a realistic point of view as well. What is reality? What were they putting out there that was was wishful thinking, or was there anything in their production numbers that wasn't right in the way their their orientations were? So. That was part of our, our um, rating as well. And I think that, that made, what we found out was that um, that wide range caused some concern for some other questions that we had as well. And so that's how we focused a lot of our um, final three or four based on what reality was as well. Right. So what I would say going forward um, and any other counselors, please feel free to weigh in. But um, the the committee has yet to put forward their final recommended bidder, right? What we see, what we see here is an in process review. But based on the discussion we've had here tonight, th this will all theoretically change in some cases based on the town's objective. So. I, I, I think that on a go forward basis, Tom, that you probably shouldn't participate in making the final recommendation. Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, so, uh, you know, at, at, at a minimum, Councilor Devereaux, I see your hand raised. Um, Tom, I, oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, we. Okay. Okay. Tom, I, I really appreciate your expertise. Uh, you've been there for 25 years, it sounds like. Is that what you said? No, no. I've known the owner of Amoresco for 25 years. I've known the company a long time. I've been on the board for four years. For four years. Okay, okay. Um, I'm just curious how you've been uh, managing the conflict this far. It, it, it sounds like um, you... you you told them about the conflict, but you're still working on the project. Is that what's happening? All we've done is we, what we've done is that we got the bid, we analyzed their bid, we came back and asked them for clarifications. And then, you know, we did, you know, we, we pulled together, someone had to pull together the, 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 the spreadsheet analysis, but everyone's looked at that. So I wouldn't say I'm working on the project, and I'm certainly not talking to Amoresco about it. Well, what I, what I mean by project, I mean as a group, as a committee, you're all working on this as a project. Um, and, and just for clarification for my sake, how were the bids um, opened? Were they all opened at the same time or as they came in? Uh, there was a deadline for the projects. In other words, you had they may not come to all on the same day, but they had they had a deadline for coming in. It was okay, so you opened them after the deadline. So they were all opened at the same time? Correct. Yeah. 
Okay. No one saw anything. They're all sent to Perry and then they're all in. Perry sent them all to all the committee members. Okay, okay. I'm just, I just want to, um, and as you stated, you know, avoid the appearance of impropriety and um, how are you proposing to manage the conflict going forward? You know, I think, I think it's, for me, it's certainly don't talk to Amoresco. I think, you know, we go back, if they're shortlisted, we go back and with all these bidders and ask them to put a best and final with some clarification around, you know, whether the town's going to keep the recs or not. Um, and then, um, you know, I think at this point with the final bids, we have enough on the modeling exercise that someone else on the team could take over the financial, the, the spreadsheet and run the analysis and come up with the recommendations. Um, and then I would just excuse myself from those, from the decisions. Okay, okay. Cause um, oh, we don't have a, um, a written policy, but we need to follow the state law. And it just sounds like um, yeah. a, a full recusal is um, gonna be important here since um, you are on the board of yeah. uh, MRSCO. Councillor Penny Jordan, go ahead. Oops. Okay. All I wanted to say is, uh, number one, Tom, I understand exactly what has transpired that it, it's been a lot of group work up to this point and um, no um, uh, specifics around any organization you might be involved with that you haven't really um, been a super proponent of. You've let the process happen from a very um, team and subjective perspective. I like what you just said about how you would work going forward, which is really where my question was going. And so twice tonight, you've answered my question before I got to ask it. So um, number one, um, when it comes down to the final decision, um, I, I understand what you're saying is that you would not even be engaged in um, um, any uh, vote around who would get the um, bid or receive the project. Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah. And I think the only issue going forward is if the rest of the team feels they can run the screening, the, you know, the model where we take all this stuff and figure out which is the best option, you know, someone else I think should be able to do that. The only thing I can say is someone says, gee, we need some help fixing the model. I would say, well, I would help do that, but not participate in the decision. Because it's just going to come down to numbers now. Great, thank so, you. So um, I, I think the best course of action um, at the moment uh, is is probably standing down, Tom, from from your engagement on the on the RFP. Um, and I, um, Matt, if you could reach out to um, outside counsel as well, um, just to get a um, an opinion rendered for for the council on that. I'll do um, the first thing in the morning, Mr. Chairman. I, I think um, I think Tom, as you indicated, that you know the committee has uh, the necessary Sorry. means in place. Oh, somebody have something to say here? Uh, I think the committee has the necessary means in place to continue, um, you know, moving forward. Um, but you know, we we just really need to to make sure um, we we cover crossing eyes uh, crossing t's and dotting eyes on this um um you know just just you know number one to adhere to our policies and rules and number two uh, to protect ourselves in the event that um you know any of the bidders that aren't awarded the project um would challenge us on it so um so i think that's i think that's the best way to move from here and i i think on that score sam kind of back to you um on um, and, and Matt uh, as well on, on where we need to go for sort of immediate short term and, and near term next steps um, uh, to, to move Jamie, forward. Jamie, oh, this ahead. is Penny. Yeah. Don't we need yeah. to give them direction on the recs? Don't we need to give them direction on well, the recs? What, yeah. So I, I, one of the questions I have is, is, is that something that we need to just come to consensus on tonight? I don't know if we need to vote on that, uh, vote on it at a regular meeting. I, that, I was not clear on that. So. Okay. Okay. Whatever you do that, um, 
we, if you noticed going back up the one slide there, Sam, um, it, it really depends on that rec decision depends on who hits our shortlist. And as soon as we can work on our shortlist uh, with the next questions for the shortlist right. members, then it would be really great for us and everybody keep our, our milestones and in I, place. I'd probably say one thing about this is, you know, uh, the town and thinking about this, you guys want to be in a position because the tax support is changing. And I think it was gone through earlier. Some of these tax credits are going to disappear. So what mm -hmm. you want to do is be in a position to sign with one of these companies in early Q4 of this year, if possible, October, November timeframe latest, you lock in the benefits. So what you need to do is work back to getting clarification bids from whoever the shortlist is, and then getting a recommendation back and getting on the town agenda so that, you know, the, whether it's the planning, final council decisions can happen in, you know, October or November. And so that comes the compression that kind of says you need guidance now if we want to keep those benefits for this year. Because if not, if you wait till next year, the savings will be less. Yep. So Matt, on the, on the question of um, setting the policy direction, is that something that we can do just coming out of this workshop or is that something we need to actually vote on? I, I think you can go by consensus this evening so the uh, committee can move forward, uh, not with a formal vote, but just if you can see that there's consensus among the council to at least let them know, uh, you know, what direction that the committee would like to go in, then they could come back uh, based on uh, the direction the council indicates and come back with their solid recommendation for, uh, for future council action. Okay, so can I start by polling the council, starting with Jeremy? Um, on what your preference is? Um, yeah, sure. I um, my preference would be to uh, allow the um, not to purchase the racks. Essentially. Okay, uh, and Valerie, you are uh, I, I agree. I think we need to maximize our savings and um, not purchase the racks. Caitlin. Yeah, it's right now. I'd agree. Penny? Um, I would say not purchase and then um, have on the horizon the seven years to um, buy up the project. And Chris, I think from your earlier comments, that's consistent with your point of view. Yeah, I was just going to note, I haven't heard uh, any of the counselors uh, comment that they were in favor of purchasing the RECs uh, in the very near term. Yeah, and I'm I'm in agreement. So I think the consensus is unanimous. I, I my my interest in it isn't so much necessarily driven by just the savings. It's more about a risk management um, play for me. So um, you know, I, I think particularly with this being the first of these projects that we would be embarking on, um, I think it it you know it it's prudent to go with a lower risk you know uh, prospect. Um, then, then be more aggressive. Perhaps for future things that might change, but I think for the initial project, it makes sense to do that. So, um, so there's your answer on um, uh, on that outstanding question, Sam and committee. Um, and then, uh, so I'm I'm not sure if there's anything that needs to. Matt, I, I know I saw in the memo about. Um, this being on the June fifteenth council meeting, potentially, or was that? That was, was that yeah, the tail end of the But that's the anticipated yeah. Uh, yeah. potential date for that. If you want to have a fraction, if things go well this evening, and that way the committee can come uh, way, away with some answers. So, maybe so what would be brought everything. back to the fifteenth meeting is the short list. Is that right? The final short list. I believe with the recommendation well, we have of who the uh, final person would be, or final team would be. Well, based on what you just told us, uh, we have a short list in the slides. Um, is that committee, is there somebody else who want to comment on that one? It's slide number nine. Yeah, right. Yeah. 
Yeah, we prepared a, um, you know, you know two, basically two different shortlists. One, uh, if the town wanted to keep the recs, and one if the town wanted to to give the recs to the sponsor. Um, so yes, the slide nine shows our our shortlist kind of based on on the latter, which of course you, the, the based on the, the feedback you've given us. Um, so these are the you know in green you can see the the, the three bidders uh, that we think are you know have the best the best um, uh, you know package. Um, so what we would propose is kind of going back to those three um, and okay, asking for for best and final. Um, and kind of you know, once we get th get that back, um, you know, sooner we get it as soon as we possibly can. I'm not sure if we can get it in time for the 15th um, town council meeting, if that were um, uh, a useful date to keep to. Well, I um, I, but we yeah. I was just confused about the, it was in your memo, Sam, that referenced the 15th council meeting. I wasn't sure what what was needed then. So yeah, yeah, we're just or, or if keep, or if there is anything needed then. So and and. There's just as, as a point of reference, I mean, our, our regular business meeting is the 18th. We've got a special meeting on the 15th for a vote on another item. Doesn't mean that this couldn't be added to that, but um, I, I guess I'm just not clear on, on what, what action is needed from us at this point, or um, is it simply the action of once the final bids are submitted, uh, the determined, um, I, f I forget the language you had in here, but um, it was um, uh, preferred bidder. You know, we, we mm -hmm. would go to go to negotiations, and, and then at, at some point, the, the council would sign off on the final contract. I think is I, I, I'm not clear on what votes are needed between now and, and that point. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, we're not together, frankly. I mean, yeah, I think ideally we'd like to be able to proceed kind of with with the process. Um, you know, go back to these three shortlisted bidders, um, and kind of you know. And, and and select you know a um, you know one of these three as kind of our preferred bidder, and then begin negotiating with them um, with the yeah. goal of getting to September 30th, um, you know, with completion of all the project review and and the, the legal work. Yeah. Um, so one question we had, of course, was like, you know, what are those what are those those touch points we need to uh, to have with you so, um, in terms of your approvals? I would think that. Um... Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, I would think of the the next step on this would be upon receipt of a preferred bidder uh, based on this direction, would we then want to have prior to engaging the planning board and, and the like, would we have a public hearing first or wait till after it goes through planning board review? They they would have their own public hearing as part of that. If, if, if I may, yep. Mr. Chairman, uh, th uh, thank you. I think what should, your next step would be if, would be to enter into negotiations, uh, potentially for uh, formalizing an agreement uh, with the with the preferred bidder uh, from that group would probably be the action that the council could take at that point. And then uh, that would also give them the opportunity if they were uh, actively negotiating with the town uh, that they could then perhaps on the dual track uh, go forward with a proposal to the planning board because the planning board process, as you know, uh, could take a bit of time uh, yeah. to get through. Should have to, uh, to go through a workshop and then come back, and then you know that with the scale and the scope of this project, it may take a little bit of time. So if those two could run on a parallel track while we were negotiating with them, and that would be engaging legal as well to make sure the terms of the uh, of the contract were spelled out clearly, uh, and we'd have to find uh, specialized talent, which I, I I know we can find that within uh, within the different. Uh, you know, it may not be our our town firm and maybe one of the local Portland firms that we that we have relationships with uh, to do that work, uh, as well as uh, review those details of the contract, get that moving forward for future action. Uh, at that point, you could have uh, you know as an, as a formalized uh, action item on a council in a future uh, on a future agenda uh, to formalize things and open and available for public comment, such as any other uh, contractual agreement that the council would be entering in on behalf of the town. I've got, I've also, Chairman, I wanted to, to point that your, the points well taken and, and obviously the um, issue of um, any kind of permitting or zoning uh, land use are really part of the due diligence package anyway, and this, they're all going to take a bit of time. So really yep. one is, is exclusive, mutually exclusive. My question to, to, you, to, you counsel, to the council is when we do choose the final 
for a bidder, so to speak. Um, do you want us to um, uh, offer the last shortlist why we picked that bidder and compare them for you at the at that meeting, or would you just go along with the bidder and, and just sort of a uh, uh, rationale why we picked that particular bidder uh, on its own? Um. I, I mean, I, I, I assume that like any um, recommendation coming from any committee, we would we would take your recommendation, um, consider it, and then and then approve the recommendation. Um, and if there was if there was debate or discussion about whether or not the the recommended vendor was the one to go with, then um, the council I, I guess could conceivably say, well, let's go with the number two or the number three. Um, th this is a little bit different than a lot of recommendations that come from other committees because it's of such a specific and technical nature that it, it's, it's less about, um, for lack of a better term, personal preference or, or even policy preference as much as it is um, re relying on, on your all's expertise in this area. So it's, um, you know, it, it, it reminds me uh, to a certain degree of a committee that I was involved in um, that made the recommendation on the design uh, for the new transfer station uh, about five or six years ago. And, I, you know, I, any, it, there, there were counselors at the time that, that certainly questioned parts of the recommendation. Ultimately, I, I believe everybody signed on on board to that plan, but, um, you know, easily any of the counselors could have said, oh, I think we should go with this other plan that would do this instead. But does that answer your question? Uh, yes, and, and just to be pragmatic, I wanna ask Sam a question while we're talking about this. There was a, as it says, a little bit of confusion as to when our next meeting should be and when we should be selecting this. Sam, do we, we do have a date in which we are supposed to pick the final bidder? Well, we have our own calendar um, that, that we've created, um, but basically I think it all boils down to the fact that we want to get, this, you know, get, get, get the, the, the paperwork all, all signed and sorted by, um, you know, in time to, for us to capture this current right. year's. Uh, do, we, do, we have a, do we have a tentative time when council would, would want to look at this thing and when we want to present it to council though? When we, we at least anticipate making this final decision? Sam, well, I would hey, say- Sam. Go ahead. Sam, Go ahead, this, Tom. I, I would say on this that, you know, it's June 1st, going back and asking these guys for the final bids, there are a number of things we're going to have to ask them and clarify them. It's going to take a few days to put the questions we want to these guys. It's going to take some time to answer them. So I think June 15th, June 18th is unlikely to come back with a recommendation. So I think you kind of put that out to a July meeting so that we can get the information, the committee can do the analysis and then make the recommendation. And I would think at that July meeting, it would be approving going into it and also the expenditure for a legal counsel and appointing legal counsel. And I think one thing that, you know, that, that I would say is I teach this kind of project finance at BU Law School. And I think you need someone from one of the Portland firms who understands how this works or else you're going to spend a lot of money. It's, it's a specialized area. There are people in Maine who know how to do it. Yep. Um, so I think it's looking at picking someone and getting that budget. And then as, as Matthew said, you run it in parallel from there to getting you know, the, the final documents negotiated, the PPA, you know, the land stuff, while the planning goes on, all with a view toward this gets done sometime in late October, early November, and then you're off to the races. Well, I just wanted to make sure that the council understands at least uh, that we're not going to be doing this in the next two weeks and they don't have to worry about us for a while and, well, and, that, we, and that we have some date. I, yeah, and I, I don't, that's why I, I didn't think it was actually, that was my initial line of questioning on this was it's sort of raising a bit of a skeptical view on that because I, I didn't think we really needed to do that. I, I did, it, so it, our, our July meeting is scheduled for the 13th, um, the second Monday is, is late in, in, in July because of when the month starts. So, um, but uh, I mean, I think if we, if we brought this forward on the 13th agenda for the council to vote to a, 
approve a preferred vendor to enter into negotiations with, that seems like the most logical next step. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, Matt, within that time, what can be done to almost pre-coordinate with the planning board in anticipation of a project coming to them, maybe even setting, you know, some, some placeholders on their, on their calendars um, in order to accommodate this. Uh, so what I was going to say was given your direction tonight, I think we, we can approach our shortlist as determined by the, your feedback tonight, get the responses from them. But at a parallel time, we need guidance from maybe if, if you, if Sam, uh, the chairman and, and Matt and possibly Jamie, just get together and figure out what the calendar needs to be to hit where we need to hit. Cause we're going to need to engage them, negotiate, sign the deal and, 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 and break ground this year. So the calendar is important. And, um, I think, you know, we, while we're talking to these, the shortlist bidders, we can get the calendar squared away. Yep. Um, and, and on, on Councillor Adams return from, from her leave, I would expect her to be in, in that role more than I, but, um, I'm not even sure how much, um, anyone from the council needs to be directly involved in it. So it's, it sounds really, Matt, it's, it's more something for, for you and probably Maureen yeah. um, and, and Sam to coordinate on, so, and Perry, so. Um, I, I don't want to pull the plug on this if there's important additional information that hmm. is either needed to convey or decisions that are needed to be made, but we're, we're running on an uh, hour and 25 minutes of this discussion, and I, I do want to make sure we get get on to the rest of our agenda. So, um, so committee, it sounds like you have the direction you need. We're, we're starting to coalesce around a, 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 a general time frame that we're pushing in the direction of. Um, Tom, you know, really appreciate your forthrightness about your individual situation and um, uh, appreciate, you know, you being transparent about all that. Um, so Matt will again go go out to our, our outside council um, tomorrow uh, just to get some further opinion on that. So if in the meantime, Tom, you could you could kind of stand down from your involvement. Um, and if if there's anything that comes up that you think requires your involvement, I, I would maybe touch base with um, with Matt um, for some guidance on that. Um, is there anything else on? on this that anybody wants to add before we move off of this topic? No, I think we have the direction that we, that we, that we needed and we asked for. Um, so thank you so much for your, for your time, counselors, um, and look forward to, to moving this forward. Yeah, and, and the last thing, I, I just wanna reiterate and underscore what was um, stated earlier a couple of times. Um, the, the body of work here is incredibly impressive. Um, the council and uh, everybody involved are really appreciative of, of the time and energy that you all have put into this um, and, and the talent that you've brought to the, to the, the role on this committee. Um, it's, it's really quite impressive. And, um, you know, re regardless of either direction that was chosen here, um, it was clear that there was an incredible amount of uh, analysis and thinking that went into, um, you know, getting us to this point. So, um, I know that there have been sort of frustrating fits and starts with some of this work dating back to the sort of uh, original uh, pulling the committee together and, and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, from where I stand, you know, to see this level of, of detail and, and professional output is pretty, pretty impressive from a volunteer committee. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I think, I think you, the work is to be envied um, uh, and uh, could potentially be a model for other communities to, to, to work from as well. So, um, th so thank you. I just want to say thank you all for your time on it. It's, it's uh, really appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, so um, seeing no other comments or discussion on that topic, we'll move on to our second agenda item which we should get through in no time whatsoever. Um, it's uh, short-term rental ordinance amendments. And um, I know that there's probably participants from the public that are looking to chime in on this as well. Um, so we'll get to that in just a second. 
Um, just by way of introduction, uh, the uh, Ordinance Committee uh, has been at work on this since um, uh, going back into last year, um, both uh, based on uh, sort of citizen request and, and, and input from uh, different folks. Uh, that had raised some concerns as well as um, direct uh, direction stemming from the uh, comprehensive plan, updated comprehensive plan that was approved last year. Um, so uh, after a, a lot of very productive uh, workshops uh, and um, meetings, um, the recommended amendments that have been brought forward here tonight for us to discuss um, uh, uh, are included in, in the information that you all have. Um, I want to open it up to public comment. Um, and uh, before doing that, uh, make sure that everybody for the public is aware that um, this is really, you know, the first time the full council uh, is, is taking an opportunity to get into this. So I know that there's a lot of folks that have been very good um, uh, participants at, at the ordinance committee uh, level and there's there's probably points that you've raised in those meetings that um, you want to re reiterate uh, here tonight and in, in future meetings uh, you're certainly welcome to do that um, I ask that uh, in this meeting though we're gonna we're gonna stick to our three minute um, rule pretty quickly uh, pretty closely rather and also it, it won't be kind of the the free flowing back and forth that um, um, you know was was useful for us in the ordinance committee meetings, but um, for the purposes of um, the town council uh, discussion, um, we want to we want to uh, not have sort of the interruptive comments and, and back and forth dialogue. So um, so anyway, if you would like to speak on this issue, um, please use the raise hand function in the zoom meeting. And you will be recognized. And uh, if you could just give us your name and limit uh, name and address or affiliation and limit your comments to about three minutes uh, in length. So the first name I see up is uh, Louise Davis. So Matt, if you could cue her up. And Louise, go ahead. Do you hear me? We can, go ahead, thank you. Okay, well, thanks to all of you. I know this has really been a touchy issue and a difficult one. So thanks to all of you and for uh, all of the the good work you've been doing. And I guess what I'd like to just say in my three minutes um, is introduce myself. I'm Louise Richardson Davis. I've uh, lived off Old Ocean House Road since I was born and my mother and grandmother and one thing or another. So um, very familiar with the Cape and glad to be here. Actually am here right now. And um, my point is just to encourage you all to focus directly on what will both address the problem issues and satisfy or address the concerns of a majority of the people and taxpayers in the town. Surely this can be done in good faith without taking a hammer to the many non-resident taxpayers like myself who would like to correct these problems, work with you to correct these problems and do renting in a very responsible, lawful, permitting following sort of a way. And uh, I guess what really strikes me is that if people, even primary owners, as well as the uh, non-resident owners are not here ho at, at the house um, when a renter comes, I know that's an issue for many people are concerned. And by the way, I, I really support, I mean, I understand what it must be like to be next to a neighbor that's just renters are running amok, so I sympathize with that. But if, if we do rent in such a way where we could um, use the, the expertise of property managers that uh, would work with us, and I, I would think it'd be a great help to the town because they'd, they'd uh, be screening for clients that um, are going to fit the character of the town, families or people that can appreciate the area and they'd be educating the people like me uh, about the fact that I need to get a rental permit and they'd be keeping records of the rentals um, for each owner and they'd be responding to neighbor complaints, which would certainly help you all with the, the whole complaint management issue. And so I, I would 
I just would really urge you to include that as a category or a option or possibility that um, working with qualified property managers, not an ad hoc person who says, I've got my house, I'm a property manager, and I'll, I'll rent to, to the bros that want to have a bachelor party there. Um, but somebody that's really professional in, in the area is, is really worthy of consideration. And I, I, I think we are worthy taxpayers here and, um, and who want to be responsible. And, and we just really hope you'll consider us and whether we have to increase the minimum stay length or, or do, do other things that might be necessary to make it um, work for everybody. Um, I just hope you consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Louise, um, if I could just ask you to provide your address for oh, us. Sorry. 51 Old Mill Road. And um, just a quick follow up and uh, if, if um, additional speakers wouldn't mind doing the same. So if you, if you are a current short term rental operator or host, if you wouldn't mind letting us know if you are comfortable with it, I'm not asking, you're not, you're not required to, but if you wouldn't mind letting us know um, sort of what category you might fall into from those that have been sort of outlined or described in the proposed amendments. I think that might be helpful for the council to understand the okay. point of view of your comments. So if you're comfortable with that, I'd appreciate it. But I am uh, a non-primary resident owner. Great. Uh, although I used to be for a long time, <laughs> but not now. And um, I would like to have the ability to do short-term rentals if possible. Um, I understand that, you know, the turnovers of certainly not a weekend, but e and maybe even seven days is, t is yep. um, tough. And I, so I guess that's the category. I mean, I feel that, that we're excluded from the current recommendations right now. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, Next up to speak is uh, Penny Pollard. Uh, Matt, if you could cue her up, please. You should be good and to go, Penny. Go ahead, Penny. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for accepting my comments. Um, I just wanted to, one, respond to um, a discussion that I had heard, and uh, it's regarding statistics that um, that I garnered from the U.S. Department of Education website about elementary school registrations because I had heard a comment at one time that part of what was driving these changes had to do with reserving stock for young families and you know to increase um, registration at the elementary school um, and you know elementary school registration is down more than five percent from 2000 to 2018 in eight states nationwide, including all of New England, um, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont are all down at least 13%. So, um, you know, I don't think any of these things have, this primary school registration is certainly not being driven by short-term rental regulations. My second comment was that I really hope that the council um, will include a provision in the rewritten ordinance on short-term rentals that would allow an application process for an appeal, something like a zoning board of appeals, to be allowed to continue being permitted to rent a property that has been compliant in an ongoing way, no complaints, responsible Cape resident and neighbor, rental house owner, um, I just think that there, it's likely that the majority of rental home owners in Cape Elizabeth have been compliant, and I've been perplexed by um, the discussion that seems to be driven largely by a few complaints to uh, some properties that have been uh, out of compliance a number of times. So. I, I just feel like we're all getting painted with a broad brush here. And I regret that and hope that there might be a way to um, have an appeal process. Thank you for the 
possibility of participating in the discussion. Thanks, Penny. And your address, if you don't mind, please. Yep, three Peebles Point Lane. Thank you. And I am a rental property owner. Thank you. Um, next is um, Melissa Burke. Matt, if you could cue her up. Go ahead, Melissa. Thanks so much. I'm uh, at Seven Point Road, and I'm a non-primary resident, um, short-term um, uh, renter. I rent out short-term. Um, and I'd like to echo the comments of the past two uh, speakers. And um, I, I feel that I've been very heard by this committee, and I thank you very much for that. Um, though I know that it's difficult to wrap um, folks like us uh, into this, I want to uh, um, continue to express my desire to uh, responsibly short-term rent, even though I'm not um, a um, full-time resident here. And I think that it can be done responsibly. I think we've done it responsibly. And um, I think my neighbors uh, here would agree and just want to pass along the fact that some beautiful, beautiful things happen because of short-term rentals. I'm able to um, continue to um, uh, plow back into the economy uh, by uh, buying locally, having local upholsterers and local um, fence mender, local folks who um, I otherwise probably I wouldn't have hired because I'm doing short-term rental and I can, um, and I want to keep up the property and I can afford to do that through, uh, through this economic mechanism. And then also, um, I think all of you saw in the Cape Courier how um, we had, uh, my neighbors had a short-term renter here that it was uh, two men coming to, um, uh, for the birth of their uh, baby by surrogate in Maine, and they were able to short-term rent in our community. And I just think that that kind of thing um, really adds, um, especially at the time of COVID, we were able to, we couldn't spend a lot of time together, but my, uh, my daughter was able to send them a message by chalk drawing on the, on the, uh, on the street there, and it was just really beautiful. I think we, it, we, we forget that we're adding to the community by sharing our community. So um, uh, th thank you uh, for hearing my concerns. And Melissa, thank you. I don't think we got your address. Oh, it's Seven Point Road, Seven Point Road. Thank you. Um, next is Marianne Lynch. Marianne. Thank you. Ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, Mary Ann Lynch to Old Colony Lane. I am a year round Cape Elizabeth resident, taxpayer, and voter. I've been here 34 years. Uh, 34 years ago, we didn't have short term rentals, and the short term rentals are a business, they really are changing the character of our residential neighborhoods. If I wanted to live in a neighborhood of short-term summer rentals, I would have purchased a home at Higgins Beach or at Old Orchard Beach. I don't object to renters renting for 30 days or more. Those tenants have not been problematic. Um, and I think that would allow property owners to make some financial use of their property, but otherwise I hope you will um, look at this as an opportunity to um, keep El Cape Elizabeth the way that it's been, uh, a, neighbor, a town of neighborhoods that are close, and it has never, it has not been a summer resort, at least not since the turn of the century and the old casino. So uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. I appreciate your attention. Thank you, Marianne. Um, next up, it's listed as James King. I'm guessing it's Deborah King, um, but uh, you're up next. Go ahead. Oh, we can't hear you. There Hi. we go. Yep, I'm go ahead, Deborah. Deborah. Yep. Hi, everyone. I'm Deborah King. I live at 125 Old Ocean House Road. Uh, Thank you all. This is really cool that we still get to meet in this way. Um, it's so nice to hear uh, these comments uh, online like this and even without faces. To just think about what people are saying. Quite heartfelt across the board. Um, 
I think I do disagree that the community uh, hasn't been a resort type place for a long time. I think it, it part of its history is that, you know, farming and, and uh, having visitors, having people have summer homes, I think that's been very common. Of course, now we have this new, new element that is um, increasing as vacations and people traveling increase. Uh, we have a unique situation. I'm a homestay. I live in my house and I just rent out a couple of rooms. And it is very, it is not the most common kind of short term stay. Uh, it, many of the things you all talk about do not apply to us at all. I don't think it's wise to um, discontinue the homestay category because of the differences. And even, you know, for example, in this time of uh, no guess, I couldn't get unemployment, even though I'm self-employed and all this good stuff. Uh, they just don't know what to do with us in this little income that we make. The other thing is that as a homestay, most of our guests are here for, um, for a couple of nights. We don't get people for a full week, anything like that. So uh, limiting us is a, is a problem. But what we provide are things like, you know, for you know, the spring vacationers, we provide a place for you know, Mother's Day weekends, mom and daughter weekends, things like that. Um, you also know that I live on two acres, with lots of property on the street, very far away from my neighbors, and you've received letters from our neighbors who support what we're doing because we're doing it responsibly. And I know that's what you're trying to encourage. Uh, so I thank you for that. Um, I very much want to encourage you to make sure that these short-term stays are supervised. I think that's the deal. And that's what we're all realizing is this can't be a top that's just sent off spinning because things do happen. And um, that's uh, what I wanted to say. And I just want to thank you again for spending a lovely night uh, at your computers in your homes. So thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, next up, I'm not sure the name it's listed here is uh, Law Robics. I'm not sure who that is, but if you could introduce yourself and Hi. go ahead. Yep. This is Sheldon Goldman. Um, I am a non-resident at 24 McKinney Point Road. We bought the home about 12 years ago in Maine, uh, famously known as the vacation state. So I think that kind of puts the, to bed the idea of whether or not this is a vacation destination. Uh, to me, this is a very basic fundamental issue of fairness and whether or not you can discriminate against non-resident owners. I mean, it seems to me what you're saying is the locals are going to get favored over the non-locals, but you can charge the non-locals the same price because we both pay the same amount of taxes. So I think it's like a fundamental issue of fairness. It's probably a fundamental issue of equal protection under the United States Constitution. And while I know that these are difficult issues, I think we have to evolve to the next place where we're not making these discrimina discrimina discriminatory ca uh, categories. That's something I fundamentally wanted to share with the board because it's a very basic concept. I brought it to your attention, I thank you, and it's gonna be in the background the entire time this, this is gonna be considered. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that would like to speak? Uh, I see Jenny Aronson, you're up next. Go ahead, Jenny. Hello, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Okay, hi, my name's Jenny Aronson. I live at 27 Lawson Road, um, and I've spoken at multiple meetings, but you said to speak up again so everyone can hear the issues. First of all, um, I just want to say when we moved here in 1997, Lawson Road was a neighborhood. There was no such thing as Airbnb. Everybody pretty much lived here, except we had some older folks who went to Florida in the winter. And kids could run around. It felt like a very safe neighborhood. And I felt like I could be in my yard by myself. I felt like um, I knew who everybody was if there was a problem. I don't think that you can really tell me that you can rent responsibly by screening people. Nobody knows what a stranger is really like when they come in. We have had trouble next door with bachelor parties and drinking and all that kind of thing. 
I just don't like having strangers around. I'm not here as a showpiece for them about how great it is to live in Maine. I really find it resentful that they want to come and see where I live. Um, I find it invasive. And um, it's very hard when somebody is violating your privacy or creating a disturbance to call and complain. I don't think it should be my responsibility to call a manager or the, the police really don't want to get involved. I don't want to spend my weekends in the summer managing a problem. So please don't put that on me. And finally, to the last comment, I don't think it's discriminatory at all to um, favor primary residence owners. These are people who live on the street, who we deal with and we share the space. And if they have a reason that they need to earn income, if they have a health problem, if they've lost their job, if they need to cover their taxes, uh, they're retired, I totally respect and would support them to do that. But somebody who has a secondary residence, you know, that's already a luxury that a lot of us can't afford. And to use that as a business in a residential area and use that business, um, I, I would think that would be something that the law should look into. This is a residential area. It's not zoned for business. And there are compromises. We don't need to have cleaning teams and strangers and people walking around with red cups and talking loudly in big groups and having reunions. That's very discomforting. And I would just like to say, I do not think it is discriminatory. Um, if you want to have a secondary residence here, I think that's wonderful. Um, but this is where I live and pay my taxes and vote. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Next up is Scott Dobos. Matt, if you could cue Scott up. Go ahead, Scott. Good, e good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope you're all, all safe and well. Um, uh, as Jamie said, uh, my name is Scott Dobos. Um, I live at 8 Farmhouse Road in Scarborough. Uh, I, I, I run the rental division for uh, Legacy Properties, Sotheby's International Realty. Uh, I am a professional uh, rental manager uh, that was referenced earlier in, in, the, in the meeting. Uh, and uh, I, I am a person that uh, screens our guests uh, and take it upon myself uh, to present the most qualified guests to the owners I do work with. Uh, currently, I work with 14, 14 to 15 Cape Elizabeth property owners of uh, different, uh, you know, different purposes with their rentals. Some are short-term rentals, some are long-term rentals, some are monthly rentals, um, some are year-round rentals, some are kind of quote-unquote the school, Cape Elizabeth school year rentals. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm selective with the owners I work with. Um, I, I work with the owners that, you know, fully understand my approach to, to renting their, their Cape Elizabeth properties. Uh, and, you know, my, my stance that, you know, I'd rather have a property empty uh, than to put the wrong people into the home that would disrupt the neighborhood is something, you know, it, it is very real to me. Um, I, I don't own any of the properties I work with, and I'm, I'm very fortunate to, to you know, be able to work with these properties. And, and if I, you know, put one of those reference bachelor parties, you know, or guests, you know, making a ruckus, carrying those red cups in, in any of the homes that I work with, uh, that's probably the last time I'll, I'll ever work with that property. So, you know, my, my point of view is, is drastically different while you know, I don't have skin in the game in the sense that this property is mine. Um, you know, my, my approach is, is from a professional uh, approach to do the best I can for the owners that hire me to represent their property um, and to bring people into the neighborhoods that are referenced. Um, and, you know, I, I take it very seriously. Uh, I belong to the Vacation Rental Manager Association. I, I study vacation rentals, the philosophy, the psychology, how, how to do the best job I can for these owners that I work with. And not, not every rental in Maine or, or the country or the world is, is run the same. There are individual property owners that do an incredible job. There's also individual property owners that do a terrible job. I think that's probably pretty evident from some of the properties that have been complained about over you know, the last few years. Um, and yeah, I, I appreciate the, the work you've done. I, I am sympathetic for the, for the people that live next to these pro problem properties. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, next up is John Bolt. John, uh, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick question for the council. Has there been any more data gathering about the, what the problem is and the impacts uh, that you're seeking to mitigate that's described in your purpose? And if so, um, where is that? And if there hasn't been any further information uh, to describe that, I'm curious as to why that is. I'll just leave it at that. If you could point me in that direction, thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Um, I'm gonna keep going with questions um, to try and get that out of the way. And then in our discussion, hopefully circle back um, to get you the answer you're looking for. Um, is there anybody who has not yet spoken um, uh, go ahead. Uh, I thought I saw one. Um, yeah, I thought so. Craig, you're up um, as having not spoken yet. So your name and address, please. Unmute here. Go ahead, Craig. Yes, hi, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Craig Cooper. I live at 150. Ocean House Road here in Cape Elizabeth. I've been a long time resident. I am a landlord uh, and I am also a property manager here in town. I've spoken at many of the uh, committee meetings. I've sent a number of emails. Um, I appreciate all the work that is being done to try to mitigate the problems that have been uh, plaguing uh, some of the areas in Cape Elizabeth. But my concerns are based on the fact that I think that the problems are a, uh, a small amount of the short-term rentals and some of the, um, the discussions and the rec recommendations that are being brought forward here are uh, extreme by nature for the, the problem areas that have been, that have, have brought this all about. Uh, primarily, um, I think that the intent of people who have taken and, and rented places in Cape Elizabeth and turned them into hotels have caused a lot of this problem. And one of my concerns as a property manager, I represent Six Point Road, which is owned by Mary Giftos, who owns two houses here in Cape Elizabeth. It's for guest house. She uses it at a guest house, has a lot of family and friends that come in the summertime, and we short-term rent it sometimes to help pay for the taxes, et cetera. We've never had a problem there. Um, just because her house is one third of a mile down the road, she doesn't fall under these uh, categories. If her guest house was next door, adjacent, with, an adjacent, with an adjacent abutting lot line, that would work uh, and could be used uh, under the short term rental. So I think that's a bit of a bias um, as well. I agree that Cape Elizabeth is also a, a summer area and vacation area. As I as spoken earlier, our license plate says vacation land. Um, so as you struggle through this, I also want to bring up the point that the timing on this, I mean, with, with, with what the town has done and what, with the 14, 14 day quarantine that's going on, the short term rental has already pretty market in Cape Elizabeth has been basically killed for the, uh, you know, the majority of this upcoming summer. And we're dealing with people who have already canceled for this year or cannot come for this year for the obvious with this pandemic that we're dealing with um, and who are trying to rent and already booking for the next season, for, for the summer of 2021. And I remember when I was meeting with this committee and talking with the committee, uh, and they were considering thinking about when any new uh, ordinances would take effect, they were sensitive to the fact that people had already rented in the summer of 2020. And now with the, uh, with, with the pandemic, as I say, that whole thing has been thrown into the summer of 2021. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, is there anybody else that has yet to speak um, that wishes to offer any comment? Um, I'll, I'll very brief, I'm not looking to get into a back and forth and I, I suspect that, uh, and I'm sorry, I, for, I forgot your first name under the law aerobics, um, uh, handle on the meeting. And I'm not looking to get back in, into a back and forth. I suspect I saw your hand go up right after uh, Ms. Aronson's comments. Um, 
I suspect that you've got something to say in rebuttal to that. I'd, I'd really rather not um, draw this out uh, in that fashion. Um, so if, if you have something else to say, um, go ahead. But um, yeah, no. the, the purpose of the comment period is not to get into sort of a, a back and forth debate, so. I realized uh, I didn't actually use the entire three minutes, so I thought I could just yeah. supplement your thoughts. Um, so it goes back to this very basic issue of discrimination, right? Uh, owners, residents versus non-residents. You know, we pay $34,000 in taxes. That's about right, I it up slightly. We don't use the school system. So we're subsidizing your school system. So it's, it seems to me that in one hand, you like us there because we're happy to be there to subsidize the school system and we're not using, that's a very net positive for you. On the other hand, you would then take away certain rights that the, other res that the residents of the town would have. It's a very, very unfair bargain. And I, th I thought I didn't make that very clear in my mind as to how unfair the bargain was because we're there to support the, uh, the village. We're just not gonna get all the benefits. And, and that's what I, I wanted to round out. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, is there anybody else who's yet to speak um, that would wish to offer any comment? I'm not seeing any hands raised in the queue. Okay, like I said, um, this is by no means gonna be the last meeting or discussion point that we have on this, but I appreciate everybody's input, uh, those that spoke tonight, as well as, um, as was indicated in the meeting packet, we've received a substantial amount of communication on this, um, both leading up to the meeting by email, as well as um, through the course of the many um, meetings that the ordinance committee has held on this. Um, so seeing no additional um, comment, I'm gonna ask the counselors, I, I know um, most everyone, obviously the members of the ordinance committee have, have been um, up to their eyeballs in this. Um, I know Councillor Devereaux has uh, attended some meetings, Councillor Abrilson has. Uh, is, is there anybody that would like me to, at the outset, just sort of walk through purpose, why we're doing this, and what the, the, the sort of top level highlights are, or does everybody feel like they've got that and we don't need to belabor that? I'm seeing heads nodded that everybody gets it, okay. Um, I just quickly wanna answer or try to answer the question that um, John Voltz raised around further data gathering. Um, John, I'm, I'm not specifically aware and I know that I don't think Maureen um, has joined us on the, on the meeting tonight. I'm not specifically aware of any other um, uh, information that's been gathered other than what has, has stood in the record and, and, and has been available with, oh, oh, I see Maureen is here, sorry. Um, uh, 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 you know, has been included in, in the various meeting materials to date. Um, I, I think, the last time you brought this up, I offered um, information that was, you know, publicly available information that had been publicly reported um, by the Press Herald about the growth of the short-term rental market uh, over the last number of years, uh, and and uh, there were some very specific data points in that about the um, number of rentals and how that had grown over time over the last uh, uh, three or four years. Um, I know that information was sought and provided about actual numbers of complaints and information has been provided about number of registered short-term rental operators versus those that are um, presumed to be operating based on um, listing information that was mined um, by a member of the, the town who, who wound up doing quite a bit of that work. And I know, I think, I think you've been involved in some of that as well. Um, so, I'm not specifically aware of any other um, any other data that's been gathered beyond that, or that the committee, you know, was was certainly referencing during the course of our discussions. Maureen, if there's anything you want to add to that, by all means. Um, but I don't think I, I think I. Maureen, are you there? there yes, you I am. I have yep. nothing to add. Okay, so um, I would, I would, I guess, punctuate that to say um, uh, the work on this is not done. If there's additional information that's deemed necessary, um, or 
um, you know, is, is offered to us, we'll certainly um, evaluate that and um, factor it into continuing discussion and formulation of, uh, of the amendments here. So um, that being said, um, since everybody is generally aware of the purpose, I think is generally clear on um, what the uh, highlights of the amendments are, um, I'm happy to just open it up to conversation among the council um, to offer any comments or ask questions or the like. So, Councillor Straw. Hi, uh, so as some of you may know, I don't fully support these amendments. And what I would propose just as a starting point is um, I'd like uh, the town planner to kind of weigh in or give us guidance on her understanding of how zoning ordinances are supposed to operate. Uh, in particular, um, the way that I have approached these ordinances um, is you have a zoning ordinance that basically lays out like your plan for how you're gonna organize your town. And it spells out a bunch of districts and each district is supposed to serve a purpose. And uh, what I'd, uh, I'd like to hear the town planner kind of explain to us how that's supposed to operate and how that's supposed to inform what uses are allowed in individual districts. And then I'd like to, uh, like to hear what are the purposes of our residential districts. And I'd like to hear how these proposed changes accomplish the purposes of the residential districts, because that's, uh, that's what's been missing from our discussion up until now. Maureen? Sure, not, not too much to ask there. Uh, <laughs> so um, I think most of you are aware that um, 98, actually about 75% of the town is zoned residential. About a third of it is so a little less than 75% is wetland. So you, you basically have a town that is almost all residential. Your largest zoning district is your RA district. Uh, that's 50% of the town. That's considered your so-called rural area. And the minimum lot size is two acres. Um, your next residential district, which is it's about 15% of the town is the RC district. That's your compact residential district. Minimum lot size is half an acre. Um, and in between those, you have a, a small amount, I think it's 7%, which is the RB, it's your growth areas, it's where the new development is going in. And you're not seeing a lot of short-term rentals going in those areas. So the vast major majority of your short-term rentals are going in your residence A districts and in your residence C districts. And not surprisingly, um, most of those are on the waterfront but maybe a little surprisingly, more and more and more of them are not on the waterfront. They are, they're, they're in anyone's neighborhood. Um, so every district has a purpose statement and I've tried to touch on the idea of the RA being the rural and the RC being the compact. And um, you know, planners have evolved over time on how they consider uh, designating zoning districts. And we have done a lot more with mixed use uh, but in Cape, you are still pretty much looking at predominantly residential uses in those zones. So the changes you're talking about, uh, and I, I'm not, I, I'm guessing at what Councillor Straw wants to get to, but I think anytime you're looking at changes to the zoning, you want to think about the purposes of those zoning districts. And the, the RA and the RC, while they are residential districts, have never been purely residential uses there have always been some uses that you would consider not necessarily residential, but you want the predominant use to be residential. And it's okay to have non-residential uses, but they should for the most part complement your residential use. Is that, did I, did I get what you wanted me to get to? Exactly, yep, perfectly. So then uh, the next step in conjunction with that is if we understand what the purposes are and that the uses are supposed to complement and fulfill that purpose. Looking at, as you noted, we, we're not pure on, let's use the RC district or the RA district, where we do allow commercial uses in, but when do we allow them in? What criteria do we apply in allowing them in? And how do these proposed uses compare to how the other uses have been allowed in with consistency? Uh, so for example, hours of operation, um, 
do we do we deem um, short term rentals to have more or less impact than uh, a seven kid daycare center that operates during daylight hours only? Uh, do we consider uh, short term rentals having more or less impact than an empty lot with a park bench in it? Um, and if it has more impact, should we not apply more stringent rules? It, or if it has less impact, then perhaps the rules should be less. So I'm looking for that consistency in uh, assessment and application. Are you looking for a response, Chris, or is that a declarative statement? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the extent, uh, the extent the, uh, Maureen uh, wants to weigh in on whether that's a, something we should be striving for with our ordinance or not, that would be helpful. Um, but then to the extent that anyone wants to argue that these are the proposal is consistent, that the proposal does treat things appropriately, then uh, we can get to that. But um, otherwise, you know that I wanted different rules. So, um, But at this point on, I'm basically going to shut up and I've raised my points my points are out there and all of you can debate to reach your conclusions. So, Councillor Garvin? Yes. If I could just um, add to what Councillor Straw said, uh, the policy decision is really up to the council, but uh, I would advise you that um, if you have a certain thing you want, you should say that's what you want and you should not rely on the um, potential good behavior of people. Um, I believe strongly in articulating performance standards. So instead of saying that, you know, we hope someone's going to be a good neighbor, we expect someone's going to be a good neighbor, you articulate what it means to be a good neighbor so that um, that can be enforced. And also to think about when you're doing enforcement, you want to be as objective as possible with your standards, because the more subjective they are, the more difficult they are to enforce and it's potentially the more expensive they are for the town to enforce. And I do want to touch on one other thing. There was one a commenter who asked if there could be an appeal process. Uh, what the ordinance, the zoning ordinance currently says is, if a use is not allowed, there is no opportunity to go to the zoning board and appeal that so that you can get permission to um, have a use that the council has chosen not to include on the list of permitted uses. Um, Penny, I see your hand raised. I, I want to jump in for just a slight resetting of the table um, and um, to say a, a couple of things about the, the process of the ordinance committee. Um, one was that um, I thought that, that this was a, a highly um, uh, productive and constructive um, approach that we took um, and it involved a lot of really, really good back and forth dialogue and discussion, um, had a tremendous amount of good input from people in the community, many of whom held uh, widely varying opinions, but throughout the process, were highly respectful of one another. Um, I thought um, uh, very caring in, in how they presented their point of view, um, but uh, uh, e even in those cases where their view differed from somebody else, um, respect was always, was always present in the conversation. Um, none of the three counselors, myself included on, on the ordinance committee, um, we're in full agreement on any of the points that are here presented. Um, and in the course of coming up with these amendments and recommendations, uh, we did so in good faith and as honest brokers about um, what we think is the best, um, you know, potential compromise of a lot of uh, conflicting um, uh, priorities and uh, uh, desired outcomes. Um, so Chris, understanding um, the point that you just made when you let off, I, I wanted to jump in to uh, number one, make that clear for everybody. Um, but number two, um, directly to you, you know, 
I, I, I might challenge you on, I, I know that it, I've come to learn in your, you know, your two plus years on the council that, that the way you tend to vote on things is in rather absolutes. And so if there's one thing that you, you disagree with um, about something, um, then, and, and I understand that, that's, that's a perfectly it's understandable a, position to take. Personality flow. <laughs> I don't think that that's going to change, um, but uh, especially for the for the nature of a workshop discussion, um, I, I I'd like to keep and continue that spirit of um, sort of open dialogue about these things um, as best as possible. When we get to ultimately voting on these amendments, um, I understand what way you're likely to go based on having sat with you in all the meetings on this, but. Um, I, I think that that, um, that is probably the best way to proceed to, to make sure uh, points of view are, are well represented. I'm not picking on you and I know oh, you- Oh, no, no, I I totally you, yeah. Can I just so add, go, uh, tie, Yeah, tie, go ahead and then I'm gonna go to Penny. Totally, I apologize to color uh, my point. Yeah. But my point is I want us to have that mindset that I discussed in deciding the outstanding issues, which include, should these be subject to conditional use review? Um, how many days should we be talking about? I, I raise that not, uh, not to say like, we should throw out everything that the committee said is that in assessing this, I would love for us to use this mindset in deciding where to, to decide on these, these outstanding issues. But uh, yep. yeah, I totally agree. I, I think I, the committee worked very hard. Uh, I think we all worked in good faith. I loved the input we got from all the various uh, members of the community and they changed my views on a number of things. Uh, where I think I was probably wrong where I started with, and I think I ended up in a more nuanced position. But yeah, I was trying to set the, here's the mental framework that I use when I come to this decision-making process. Right. Um, Penny, go ahead. Yeah, Chris, that's, uh, that's basically what I was going to ask you, is that are you asking that as we go through this, that we uh, test where uh, conditional uses can occur? Yes. And okay, that's where I thought you were you were headed. And so therefore, I think that for the full education of everybody, um, that if Maureen could talk about implications of conditional uses, because I think we all need to understand what that what that all how that all can play out. Because I don't disagree with your position that there are places where conditional uses would, uh, would make sense, but what are the implications of those decisions as we head down that road? Would you like me to respond? Yeah, go ahead, Maureen. Okay, um, so Councillor Straw has uh, often brought up the suggestion that uh, short-term rentals should be reviewed as a conditional use uh, there are some, with respect for Councillor Straw, there are some problems with that. One of them is that uh, conditional use, once granted, tends to run with the land. And if the intent is to allow abutters to have continuing input into the issuance of a permit, you would have to do something to make that a periodic re-renewal of that conditional use permit. Uh, it should be in the, in the interest of disclosure. I do not staff the zoning board, the code enforcement officer does. And so I have run this issue by him. And um, not surprisingly, he is less than enthusiastic. Uh, we have between 120 and 150 short-term rentals. And assuming that less than half of those are um, primary residences, and then maybe only a third of those end up having to need a conditional use permit, it still is going to be a tremendous burden on the zoning board um, with questionable real value. Uh, I would ask all of the counselors to look at the conditional use standards of review. Most of them do not address the issues that neighbors have had the most problems with. Um, so the concern with loud behavior and parking and the other undesirable not showing up when a, when a tenant is about to check in aren't really gonna be dealt with by the conditional use standards. So th those are the problematic situations of those. And I, I will say that um, I, as a planner, I have serious concerns making anything a conditional use because the standards tend to be somewhat vague 
and they tend to be more difficult to defend in court, uh, again, my recommendation would be that instead of relying on the conditional use review, if there's something specific you have concerns about, write that as a standard. You know, if the concern is that, um, you know, too many people are partying at 11 o'clock at night, then put in a requirement that there's, there's only a certain number of people that are allowed to be outside during, uh, after 11 p.m. Because that's a lot easier black and white to enforce. That's just an example. Does that address your issue? Um, I think part of the um, uh, conversations that we've had are around conditional uses had to do with if we set a minimum um, or um, kind of a, a baseline for number of um, days that can be rented, so 30 days or whatever it might be, that one of the applications of conditional use that we had discussed was that somebody could come forward and ask that that be increased to 90 or 180 days. But uh, then at that point in time, there would be an assessment of um, the uh, impact of that particular short-term rental on that particular neighborhood. I, and I think that that's where the conversation about conditional uses um, really uh, revolved, what that revolved around. Um, and so, and I understand your point, Maureen, about what does this do to code enforcement? Um, and as I've said before, that if we start overlaying um, things such as this, then it does say that code enforcement is not staffed properly in order to address this part of our ordinance. So therefore, it ripples into uh, fees associated with um, short-term rentals and how much it would cost for somebody to go for that conditional use. That's kind of the way I see it could potentially play out. So, so Councillor Jordan, do you, uh, excuse me, Councillor Garvin, would you like me to respond to that? Yes, please. Okay, so I'm looking at the standards for conditional use review and, and, and Councillor Jordan is correct. The discussion was that um, if you capped the number of days that someone could operate a short-term rental at 30, that you might be able to have more days if you've got conditional use review. Um, in order to get a conditional use review, you've got to go to the zoning board. You have to do a scale drawing, including existing and proposed buildings, um, proposed natural features, driveways, parking areas. You can imagine how a property owner of a single family home is going to resist having to prepare information when they're not proposing any exterior changes. So they're, they're already gonna be a little irritated. Um, and then you're, you have to demonstrate that the proposed use will not create hazardous traffic conditions, that it will not create unsanitary conditions by reason of sewage disposal, that it will not adversely affect the value of adjacent properties. Now that's, that's the golden one. That's the one that people will fight until the end of time and how they interpret it. Um, that the proposed site plan and layout are compatible with adjacent property uses in the comprehensive plan. So you can imagine someone making the argument, well, I've been renting this short-term rental for 30 days. Obviously, it's in compliance with all of these standards. And then having uh, many abutters say that this is going to dramatically degrade the value of their property. So, um, you know, we don't, I, I have not made any new things, conditional uses when I've been drafting ordinances, just because I, I have serious concerns that, and I have spoken to the, to our town attorney and he hasn't said no, that, you know, these are, these are tough, these are tough standards to defend in court. Thank you, Maureen. Um, I'm going to jump in here uh, with, with a, a number of points I want to make. Um, uh, so the first thing is um, uh, what we're doing here is really to, to address two separate issues. Number one is to respond to concerns that have been brought to the council um, around uh, 
unwanted behavior in neighborhoods that's associated with short-term rentals. And then the other is, um, you know, to be consistent with the direction that was approved in our comprehensive plan uh, within the housing goals uh, of, of that plan around maintaining uh, the viability of housing stock um, and variety of housing stock and, and, and things of that nature. I did hear somebody from the public tonight raise a question, um, which is the first time I've heard it and sitting in all the meetings that we've been in and I don't recall seeing anything that specifically um, cited it as a rationale of um, looking to boost the elementary school population. Um, I, I, don't, I don't recall that ever being a specific objective or part of discussion. Um, and in, in any questions or, or discussion that we had around housing stock, um, there was discussion of long-term rental viability of uh, people that might be looking to downsize, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of other um, multiple examples, um, but certainly no stated purpose on the either part of the committee or, or um, intention of, of the ordinance um, to specifically address that point. Can we um, to that just very quickly? Sure, Chris. Because I, I assume that was based off of my comment, um, which I think Councillor Adams also kind of made a similar comment, which might have also been it, but it was basically the observation that there is a holistic, um, there's a, what am I call it, the virtuous housing cycle. And it, what it is, is it's uh, interruption of the housing cycle in the turnover that normally happens. And I think it may have been misconstrued as somehow being needed, needed to boost school enrollment, but the point wasn't school enrollment. Uh, I apologize if it came across that way. It's that there's this normal cycle that occurs with a uh, housing stock, and this is a disruption to that cycle. One could argue, and I think Penny made this point before, and then I'm gonna shut up because I know I said it was gonna be short, that perhaps this is a new cycle that's been established. Um, yeah. Um, I just wanted to be clear, and, and for the purposes, since it was brought up in this specific meeting, that um, at no point was that an objective looking to be satisfied is, is the point I'm looking to make. Um, my position on these amendments is um, they are not perfect, um, but uh, sort of echoing along the points that I, I made earlier about the nature of the work that the committee did, um, I think that they go a long, long way towards um, uh, solving um, the issues um, that are the primary ones that were to be addressed. Um, so, you know, number one, um, this would dramatically change how we currently regulate uh, short-term rental units in so much as that every single operator of a short-term rental would have to have a permit. So that's not something that we do today. Um, you know, based on the current definitions of what type of uh, short-term rental operator you are, you may or may not need to have a permit. So by um, virtue of these amendments, we would require everybody to have a permit. What that does, it eliminates the confusion of who does or does not need a permit. Um, it gives us a really clear and realistic picture of what amount of short-term rental activity we have going on in town and provides us the ability to benchmark against that. So to the question that John Volts raised earlier about data and things like that, we would have a, a much more true view of um, you know, the amount of activity, the amount of properties um, and what was going on on a year over year basis with them. And it also would deliver the revenue that we would need to support um, the compliance measures that are outlined in the amendments. So that also goes to the point about compliance where um, these amendments would um, allow for the mechanism where we would contract with a much needed third party compliance um, uh, vendor uh, to supplement the efforts of the code enforcement officer. Today, uh, if all Ben did every day of the week, eight hours a day was work on short term rentals, um, he still wouldn't have enough time to address all of the things uh, that are involved with that. Um, by, uh, by increasing that enforcement um, and, and that compliance, we increase our ability um, to um, cite and penalize the offenders uh, that are falling out, sort of outside of that compliance. Um, and by raising and increasing the fees that would be associated with the um, the permitting process, we would make it expense neutral. So there's not a negative financial impact to the town by having the contract with the third party. Um, 
obviously a big component of the amendments is the primary residency um, as the as the as the primary um, threshold for eligibility. Um, I think that this achieves a number of different things. Number one, it reduces the speculative real estate investment that we have seen going on um, uh, as evidence, um, you know, from uh, uh, realtors that have been spoken to uh, throughout this process that, um, you know, people that are buying once uh, either long-term rental homes or, or primary residences and turning them into strictly short-term rentals. Um, this would greatly uh, reduce that and I think satisfy the goal um, that I said that was outlined in the, um, in the comprehensive plan. It would ultimately you know, reduce the number of short-term rental guests uh, in the calendar year the way it's currently worded um, because number one, you'd be reducing the number of um, potential short-term rental units available, but also uh, shortening the window in which um, they could operate. That is one point, as as Chris and Penny both know, that I actually disagree with um, the the current um, limits that are that are outlined in the ordinance. Um, it dramatically will reduce the amount and, and likelihood of unwanted behavior at the short term rentals, and it it does not eliminate it entirely, uh, eliminate that risk entirely, but it it would dramatically reduce it. And um, the reason it would is because if it's your primary residence, you have a lot more skin in the game than if you're uh, an absentee landlord that is strictly renting out for a business purpose. And so um, if, if it's your primary residence, you're going to care a lot more about what goes on there um, than somebody who has no other interest other than drawing revenue off of the property. Um, the last thing is that it would allow the responsible property owners um, that are looking for a supplemental use and a supplemental income associated with their property, the ability to do that. We heard from a number of people um, during the committee's process that spoke to the fact that uh, they're gone for a month or six weeks in the summer at their lake house or, or something like that, and um, that they uh, are able to um, gain needed revenue uh, to either pay their taxes or for some other reason um, by having the ability to rent out for that short amount of time, relatively short in a calendar year, but that it's still their primary residence uh, the rest of the year. Uh, so that was, I think, a, a very important thing for me to, to, to have uh, to, to allow those people to continue to do that. Um, so, you know, those are the, the really the key points that the amendments address. Um, and like I said at the beginning of my comments, it's, it's not anything that is going to be 100% perfect, um, but I think in this case, it's a very good example of a great deal of progress um, being preferred for me over trying to come up with something that's 100% perfect. So are there others that wanna offer any discussion or comments? Jeremy? Um, I'd just like to thank the Ordinance Committee um, for the work that you guys have put into this. Um, I, you know, as, as you said, Jamie, uh, not 100% on this revisions. I think I, I you know, I, I, my preference would be for something that's a little bit tighter and has fewer, fewer uh, provisions in it, but um, I, I think this is a good compromise that meets the objectives that we set out to, um, to, uh, to, when, we, when we started looking at this. Um, I, I guess I would just like to weigh in on the conditional use and the rental period caps. Um, I think for me, the, the need for third party enforcement is kind of a, a no brainer. Um, we, we, that, we need that <laughs> as part of this ordinance. Um, my, I, I tend to agree with Maureen. Um, I, I'm not in favor of building in conditional um, use, building this in as a conditional use. Um, I also uh, would tend to, in that range of two weeks to 180 days, um, I, I can certainly live with 90. Um, my preference would be to, to have that limit a lot closer to two weeks than 180 days, though. Okay. 
Go ahead, Valerie. Okay, I also want to thank the committee who did so much work and all of the people who have come to the meetings. It's been really phenomenal um, hearing from everybody in the community that's come forward. And um, I think it's given, I know it's given me um, uh, additional insight into what we're doing here just by hearing from everybody. Um, my, I'm not in favor of um, building in a conditional use review. I'm not in favor of that. Um, as for the cap, I, I like the 90 days. I think that's um, a good compromise for an unhosted SDR. I, um, the fees were something that I know we hadn't really discussed it much, what we're going to charge for permit fees. And I don't know if you discussed it at the last meeting, but my thought was just to kind of float an idea out there of, you know, some houses rent for 500 a week, some rent for 5,000 a week. There are some that um, people are renting per night rather than per week. Um, when we heard from Ms. King, she rents hers. Um, you know, she has a room that she rents. She doesn't rent her whole house. So, and then um, I talked to Matt um, some time ago about this. I know we don't charge um, like an occupancy tax or anything like that, where some towns and cities do that. Have we thought about um, the possibility of a um, like a 5% fee, like a use fee, or build in a, um, a sliding scale on permits to where if somebody's renting, Maybe it's based on the value of the home. If they're renting the home for 5000 a week, maybe they pay more on a permit than somebody who is renting for 500 a week. It's just, a, just a thought. It might be um, a way to um, pay for, help pay for the third-party enforcement, too, and make it a little more equitable um, rather than just having a, a flat fee for everyone. I don't know if that, that might be too difficult. Um, Maureen, Maureen, maybe you have some ideas on that. Um, Valerie, can I jump in on that real quick? Sure, um, sure. So I think, as I understand it, the way that um, you know, folks like host compliance and others like them work is it's, it's a per property. The, the, the cost that the town would incur is based on the number of properties that are, okay. that are in the system. So regardless of its a $1 a night stay or a $10,000 a night stay, it's the same amount of effort or involvement on the part of the vendor uh, to do the work that they're doing. Um, I also think that the variability probably throughout the course of the year on what uh, a particular rental is going for, you know, it might go for a certain cost in peak July versus, you know, April or something like that. Um, I don't know if there'd be consistency um, you know, in, in terms of that pricing, that if, if you were envisioning some sort of tiered system, like I think I just heard you describe, that it's it's conceivable, but that the same the same property might go in and out of that tier. So I don't know. Maybe you're talking about what their average rental is for the for the whole year or not. But um, it also I think requires amount of um, you know self reporting on the part of the uh, uh, the property owner um, that would uh, certainly add a, a, a much more complicated layer um, than probably just a straight, you know, a straight uh, equitable fee. But um, right. and that's that's just how I understand how how host compliance works. So. Okay. Well, that's good to know. My other thought was um, we're, we keep saying days, like ninety days, thirty days. And some people rent uh, by the week and some, um, it's a homestay and it might be two days here, two days there. What if we used weeks instead of days? Instead of saying 90 days, we say 14 weeks or 13 weeks since it's not necessarily a block of time. I don't know if um, that might make it more um, understandable for people so they're not thinking, oh, well, I get 30 days 
I can rent, um, you know, for three days here and then seven days here, and then and, and it ends up being more than um, 13 weeks. Does that make sense? I'm not sure I totally follow you. Yeah. You don't? Okay. Uh -uh. Well, um, some people don't don't rent their place out for a whole block of time um, for one whole week. And, uh, and I'm sure what we're saying in the, um, is the, in the ordinance is even if they rent it out for three days, it's considered a week. Correct. Correct. Yep. Yep. Okay. So we're saying months instead of weeks. Um, and we're not saying it has to be consecutive months. Correct. Uh, we're just saying 90 days. So they know that it's a, okay. Well, I'm just thinking it might be easier to say weeks rather than days since um, we're saying um, you, you rent for one week at a time. So the, the, the uh, as I think we understand it, the, the, the guest might not rent for a week at a time. They might just rent for two, three nights, but that property is not eligible to be rented multiple times within one week's period. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that okay. 90 days could spread out more throughout the year. The, 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 the nature of the 90 days, it, it's not, it's, it's actual rental booked, booked nights. It's not, a th it's, it's not like they only have three months to rent. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And, and frankly, it's part of the point why I didn't favor the, the limits to begin with, but, um, cause I think in my, in my opinion, the nature of it having to be somebody's primary residence, number one limits you to roughly 182 days per year. Um, mm -hmm. that you'd have available to you. And number two, on a practical level, most people for whom it's their primary residence are in it more days of the year than that. And so I think, I think there's a, a, a sort of almost natural selection limit that happens based on the nature of it being your primary residence versus having to add a complex layer of, um, you know, oh, well, this type of property is only 90 days this type of property is 30 days you know we went through a lot of machinations about that and you know one of the things that i've tried to focus on is how can we craft amendments and regulations that achieve the objective while also staying as simple as possible and not over complicating things so but my understanding too is there's no there's no limit on hosted stays, correct? Right. Okay. Right. So I think what Jamie's proposing is that the same is true with uh, primary residents uh, unhosted is to have it the same as hosted. So how do we want to get to conclusions on on these things because I want to do we want to take them one at a time because I'd like to also proceed to the seven acre thing um, and uh, do we want to uh, have everybody go off and think about uh, durations of uh, renting and implications of that and we all come back together or do we want to uh, resolve some of these this evening Um, my opinion is that probably, I, I, I think it's unlikely anything's to be resolved tonight. Um, right. I, what I'm hope, what I was personally hopeful of is that everybody sort of digested the rationale, um, mm -hmm. you know, sort of came to their own conclusion on whether or not they're generally supportive of the direction we've gone in, uh, mm -hmm. as a committee. Um, okay. if there's anything that's sort of a showstopper, um, you know, I, I can't, I absolutely can't live with this. 
Um, you know, those are the kinds of things that we'll wind up having to have votes on, just like we did in the committee. Um, so, um, okay, then, you know, then maybe we could throw out some things such as how one, how the group feels around the um, short term rental adjacent, uh, because that gets into the um, uh, the lot that has multiple uh, buildings, only one can be rented as short term rental or adjacent properties, things like that, and how other people have a clear understanding of what that is about. People comfortable with that one? Good point. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, yeah, so uh, in conjunction with that, just because we have had uh, people question some of these proposals, uh, if Maureen is up for it, if, if she's familiar with it, if she could describe um, her, her uh, understanding of what are known as savings clauses and uh, whether it would be feasible for us to put in a savings clause saying if any of these particular proposals are challenged and thrown out that um, short-term rentals become a prohibited use or otherwise if the council would prefer to make it a just completely allowed use with no restrictions. But she could speak to that if she's up for it. Go ahead, Maureen. Um, I'm not sure what you're asking. I know we could, um, this amendment would go into the zoning ordinance and the whole zoning ordinance has a severability clause. So if we get challenged on any bit of it. Um, we may lose that one bit, but everything else is still there. So um, even if someone were to challenge one part of it, um, I think the, the rest of it would survive. Uh, I know you did get a uh, it's amazing how many people have interpretations about the US Constitution these days. Um, I can tell you that uh, we did get an opinion from John Wall about the uh, primary residence versus a requirement that if someone was a Cape Elizabeth resident and um, the giving people preference because they're a Cape rev resident is a no-no. It's, uh, I think it's the fourth amendment. But he didn't uh, say that we had a problem with allowing a requirement that people who have their primary residence would be able to operate short term rentals in a more expansive way than people who it is not their primary residence. Um, when we have these types of amendments, uh, typically when you get close to the point where you're considering adoption, we have the attorney do a review anyway, I'd be happy to do that again here. Uh, I don't want to be flip, but um, you know, if someone really wants to rent a short-term rental in Cape Elizabeth, they can move here and, and they can rent their, their home and become a permanent resident and fall under that category. So uh, I don't know if I've answered your question, Councilor Straw, please let me know if I haven't. Uh, for the most part, yeah. As you know, with the severability, it's the everything else. It sounds like you're saying everything else uh, survives. And I was saying, I guess my question is, Let's say that what was challenged was something that basically, uh, where we drew a distinction between primary residents and nine primary residents. And let's say that was somehow struck down. Uh, how would we want things to play out from there on out? And can we draft a, an additional section of the ordinance saying that if this is struck down, then here's how it plays out. And if uh, I'm going too into the weeds, we can just ditch it. I just thought it was a good place to bring it up now that we're discussing this uh, adjacency um, situation as it starts to move a little more afield from primary, uh, pure primary residents. With, with Councilor Garvin's permission? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, so the, the primary residence requirement, there are many, many, many places that are using that now. Um, not just in Maine. Uh, I did a spreadsheet. I'd be happy to send it out to the council and it was just a survey, not like a comprehensive one, but different states. <laughs> Uh, places in the state of Maine, Boston has adopted that. Um, so I don't think that we're really in jeopardy with making that requirement. Uh, but, you know, let's make sure whatever decision the council makes is as legally defensible as possible. I would ask our town attorney to uh, craft for the council a set of whereas statements 
that really expresses the, the will of the council when you adopt something like that, so that if you are challenged in court, you would have the, the legal basis for defending yourselves. But that does not seem like a, an out there kind of requirement. If there was something else that it felt like we were really kind of leading the charge, then we should have a fallback position, but that doesn't feel like one of them. Penny, did you want to push on some of those other questions? You're muted. Penny, you're on mute. I was talking to myself. Um, it was a great conversation for the moment. Um, anyway, the seven acres piece, or um, greater than seven, um, and um, one of the things that um, came up was number of days around that as well, and whether that should be um, extended to <coughs> um, 180 or uh, something along those lines. And I don't know if, um, and I know that it was John Green from um, Sprague Court who, who brought this up. Uh, relative to Ram Island because um, his his position is that this um, purpose statement gets into it's about um, residential neighborhoods and um, um, Ram Island really doesn't fall within that um, kind of realm of uh, a traditional residential neighborhood um, and uh, and they do do short term rentals in that um, down on that complex. And so he was he put forward whether um, we could look at the um, number of days for a short term rental um, relative to that uh, land mass. Um, and I know that others brought up um, the greater than seven acres and the fact that they do unhosted um, short term rentals. And so I think that's an area that we need to discuss as well. And I so don't know if there's, I don't oh, know if there's a way to distinguish is there and does it even make sense because I agree with you, Jamie that part of doing this was to try to simplify things. Um, is there a way to, um, uh, to look at, and that's when we came up with the seven acres, was to look at larger land masses um, and um, short-term rentals relative to that. And um, do, do, we, do we look at, any of these larger land masses differently. And I'm not saying yes, we do, but I'm just saying that we need to entertain um, the larger acreage in town. Does anybody else wanna comment on that? Go ahead, Valerie. Uh, because it's so big, the seven plus acres, I, I don't have a problem with it. Um, and it's a use they've done for years, uh, unless this is something where they get a variance or something and call it a camp. Uh, I think that, um, I don't see a problem with 180 days there. I mean, I certainly don't have a problem with 180 days. I don't have a problem with 180 days anywhere else. So. Um, what's, what's everybody feel about next steps on, like I said, I, I didn't think we were going to 
sort of necessarily solve or resolve any of this stuff tonight. We're, we're approaching 10 o'clock. Um, I think that's more than a reasonable amount of time to have spent discussing, um, discussing this this far. Um, so what does everybody feel about kind of next steps you want to go in? Um, just have another workshop, um, you know, just to lay out the particulars on this, um, this is going to require uh, at the point where we're all comfortable with the amendments um, uh, referral to the planning board. Um, they're going to have to have a uh, uh, workshop on it, a uh, public hearing, uh, come back to us. Um, may or may not require going back to the ordinance committee, depending on what comes out of the planning board um, or what other direction the full council um, you know, has for changes they may or may want, not want to see. Um, and then ultimately, I expect that it'll have a full council public hearing um, before voting on it. So um, do folks want to have another workshop where we discuss this amongst us prior to referring it out to the planning board? Do we want to get that process going now? What, what, what are folks thinking? Penny? Jamie, do we need to um, actually vote on our recommended, our changes before it goes to the planning board? Meaning, um, and I don't know if you guys want to do this, but um, to, uh, if we have to vote on things before it goes to the planning board that we all agree that they they, they, you know, the day limits, et cetera, that we all agree with these definitions. If we want to do that at a, a council meeting, I'm just feeling like another workshop is going to be um, not very definitive. Whereas if we make decisions at our council meeting, we're going to be definitive and move it on to the planning board. And then it's going to come back and Matt's raising his hand. Go ahead, Matt. I mean, I was going to say though that, um, we, we would still be forwarding a draft to the planning board. We're not, we're not I, voting I to approve want, anything, but. I want to forward a draft that we all agree to some extent the content, such mm -hmm. as the days, et cetera. So don't. Well, we that's why I was kind of asking for the absolute showstoppers and not the, not the, well, I, you know, um, the longer this moves forward with the numbers that exist in there, the more they become uh, the, um, the, the answer. I think we need to say that here are the, um, the, the limits on days that we're putting in there, or we have no limits on days. We've got to make whatever goes to that planning board can't be, well, we sort of feel this way. I think it has to be, this is how we feel. Well, I, I would say for the for you and Chris and I, what's here represents that, right? I mean, we, we, the hey, three of us. Hey, have, hey, hey. So hey. I, I want to hear. No, I, hold on. Let me just. I want to hear from others who have, we're not really hearing from that much. <laughs> it's, it's the you, me, and Chris that's been dominating the conversation. Um, because I know, that's, but that's what that's what the three of us got to 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 produce this. So, but. I'm going to just say that I agreed to move it forward because we said that we would address these numbers when it came here. That's right. where so, I came from. Uh, okay. Uh, we, we, need, we need people to weigh in. Okay. Jeremy? Um, I, I'm not uncomfortable with anything that's in here. I think the ordinance committee is going down the right road. Um, and I am fully in favor of the ordinance committee, you know, taking this conversation, making some decisions on a draft of this and forwarding that to the planning board. I don't, I don't feel the need for another workshop to, to talk through this. Can I make a point? Go ahead, Chris. I think Penny's point was, this is not the decision of the planning board uh, with respect to the day number. We're asking you to tell us your opinion don't say that you accept that. And I don't mean to criticize. I don't mean to come off as a jerk. Um, it's one of my many character flaws. Uh, what we're saying is we want to hear from you. We put this in as just a placeholder. So if, if what you want is a placeholder, that's great. But just understand that this wasn't necessarily all of us agreeing on this number. It was the number to put in so we could get it here so you guys could weigh in with your independent opinions. 
I, I just want to say, I mean, my view, placeholder sounds like it's something that none of us had any faith in. So, I, I, I mean, the 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 point I made about us not all agreeing on it, but this is the compromise we came to. There's a difference between a placeholder that's just there. You might as well just have, you know, Greek text or X's or something in that case, if it was truly just a placeholder. But, you know, we had thoughtful discussion that said, well, okay, this is where we're we're landing for now. None of us feel great about it for a variety of different reasons, but this is what we, this is where we landed. So I, 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 I understand the point that it's might not be the final number, but it's more, I would say it's more than just an arbitrary number thrown in there is what I'm trying to say. I don't disagree with that, but I don't want to send something to the planning board that, um, I'm going to just say, I don't want to send something to the planning board that um, I don't necessarily um, stand behind 100%. But I guess that comes up when we vote to send it to the planning board. I can vote accordingly. Valerie? Well, um, I think we can we can go down the list of a few of these things and just see like I agree with the unhosted seven plus acres 180 days. I agree with unhosted primary residents 180 days. I agree with hosted primary, which is like a homestay, unlimited days, and I agree unhosted non-primary residents. That's ad adjacent residents. Uh, uh, 90 days. So that's kind of where I stand. I think that's similar to where um, Jamie's coming from. Um, I would have it a little bit looser. So that's um, my thoughts on the days. And um, penalties, levels of enforcement, you know, we've got um, emails from people wanting to know what our penalties for advertising or renting without a permit. I think that's something that we may need to tighten up too. So I don't know, Jeremy, what, what are your thoughts about um, the number of days and all and Caitlin, maybe that's something that we can um, kind of come to a consensus on. Jeremy. Sorry, I was actually pointing at Caitlin since he hasn't had oh, a chime in yet. I didn't see her hand raised, but um, Maureen, I do see your hand raised. Go ahead. Maureen, did you want to say something? Yes, I do. If I could just get the mute yep. button to work. Um, and, and with respect to Councillor Penny Jordan, I'm, I'm trying to be respectful of the fact that it's 10 o'clock and, and you guys have been working hard on this for many, many months. Uh, I, if you're comfortable, I think you have enough here to send to the planning board. Um, and I think the value of the council being willing to take the time to have this workshop tonight is to look at this is a this is a new structure it's really focusing on primary residency as a major organizing element and if these are the if you're generally okay with that it may be enough to send to the planning board because things like changing the number of days that's an easy thing to change um, in terms of of changing the text in the in the ordinance um, and I, I do, I say that knowing that Council Penny Jordan does not like to leave these numbers the way they are, but um, I also am hearing people saying that they want to get this ordinance done this season so that people can plan for next year. And I just thought I'd offer that. Penny? I, where I come down is that as something traverses through a bureaucracy, the points at which you pass things along saying that 
it will be addressed at the next stage. In many instances, stays there as a result of um, having not addressed it before when you uh, have the opportunity because the outcome will be that the and you can say maureen pass it along you have enough but that's passing something through a bureaucracy that then becomes the answer and i have seen it happen a thousand times um, as you pass systems requirements through as you're designing major systems and if I have an opportunity to change these numbers before they go to the ordinance committee. I will propose that I want to change those numbers. So, Penny, my point, I, I, I don't, I understand what you're saying. What I was trying to say before in expressing that the numbers that are in here are what resulted from the three of us over many months time sort of having these same conversations is that, um, you know, I'm happy to try and continue to convince people to come over to my line of thinking on things. And unless three more of you do, I'm also content to let these numbers go as they are because I think they're a reasonable place to have landed. Um, I don't fully agree with them uh, in, in some cases or, you know, various aspects, but, but so in, unless there's, unless there's movement amongst folks that says, okay, you know, we think that this should change to that, then I'm not, I'm not sure where it gets us anymore. But neither do I, I guess where I come from is that as we having lived through this process, many and many are, or uh, there were points at which we, we put numbers out there to say, we're going to come back. And we did come back and we did discuss some, but we also had some where we said, um, um, this one takes a little bit more discussion. Um, and then we agreed that we'd send this along to the council. Um, Jamie, if, if I don't have a problem with the, um, the, um, the primary residence unhosted being similar to the hosted. I don't have a problem with that. I do have a problem with that we have um, some uh, numbers in there that should, that I feel need to be 180 days versus 90 or whatever. And so, that's what I'm proposing. And I think uh, Valerie Devereaux agreed it with- Sounds like we need one more person then. <laughs> okay, Caitlin. <laughs> Go ahead, Caitlin. Your arm disappears in the outer space there. So it's really hard to see if you're raising your hand or not, but. I, yeah, so I'll finally chime in. I've been listening to everyone. At one point we talked about hashing this out at our next actual meeting that's going to send it to mm -hmm. the planning board which i'm in agreement that i think some of the numbers need to change but at the same time it's 10 o'clock at night and i think we need to go into our meeting no having a list of what it is that's going to be looked at and if we could have that list like you know a week in advance would be great so that everyone's coming with you're going to have your decision made and what your opinion is of this number, this number, this number. We're going to set the numbers and send it to the planning board at our next meeting would be the approach that I think would be the smartest. Then everybody can take the next, I don't even know when we're having that meeting. Matt just told Mon me about Monday. Meeting. <laughs> um, Monday. Monday. Next Monday. So if we could know that we're coming to that meeting, that we need to know these numbers and make that decision and set it and see what the planning board says and goes from there. Go ahead, Matt. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. Thank you. You know, listening to the conversation, it, not to belabor the point, but it really sounds like you need another workshop. No. To sit down because uh, no, I will at say, the meeting. No, we're I, doing it at the meeting. My experience Do it at a meeting where a vote can be taken and be done. 
but but the concern is that it's very difficult for council to make substantial edits to any ordinance uh, at the council level uh, when you're trying to move it forward from that point into the next next round. So if you get to some place, you have a chance of as as Councilor Penny Jordan had said, uh, looking at this systemic problem that might go forward, and you might find uh, you know you're marrying in haste, but you're going to have to try to repent at your leisure. Uh, so the concern would be if you if you're if your product wasn't ready to go forward uh, and you come and you try to make a decision because you just you just want to move it to the next step, you may find that you 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 come forward with a document that you may not uh, you may you may come back to this square again is what I'm concerned uh, that you might run into and I'd, I'd hate to see you do that so uh, it, it is June and the goal is to have it for the next season uh, so you're really quite a ways out. Uh, but I think you may be better to have it as the sole, sole focus of one, uh, one workshop with having uh, the, the language of the entire ordinance laid out and you can go right through each section to, to make sure everybody's in accordance with the changes or the direction that you're going in. I would say that if, if that is the direction that the group decides to go, that it's really incumbent upon everybody to do a significant amount of homework to come to that meeting, um, you know, ready to uh, ready to really roll up sleeves and and edit on the things that you feel like you're not comfortable with, and um, people also need to be able to um, uh, express uh, either agreement or disagreement and be able to to move on from it. So, um, I think we've very clearly articulated and laid out the principles of the amendments involved here, but um, w without people being ready to commit to taking action, we're, we can't go any further. Yeah. Go ahead, Matt. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the one thing I was saying, your next two dance cards are pretty full. Uh, you have a fully carrying on the school board budget next week. Uh, as well as uh, the the formal action on the on the fifteenth, uh, looking at July as another option. Uh, the sixth lines up really nice if you wanted to have a workshop, and then you could have an item for an action item for the thirteenth at the council meeting on that on that evening. But it would be adding you ge you generally haven't had a workshop in the month of uh, of July, but uh, that that at this point would could line up pretty well with your with your calendar if you so chose. Well, nobody's going on vacation anywhere anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> as long as the internet's up. <laughs> I think I think our challenge is. I, I don't. Sorry, I, sorry, Penny. Go ahead. I, I think our challenge. There's a delay is, there. <laughs> I think our challenge is. I think our challenge is is that when we laid out our next steps, um, moving to workshop, which we're here now, then to the council, that. Uh, back to the council and then to the planning board can take uh, up to 90 days before you even come out of planning board, get back to the council, set a public hearing, and then vote. So we're out into November, probably, if we say July, August, September, October, November. Now you got new town councilors. Exactly, yippee. Yep. Uh, Go ahead, Matt. If I may, looking at, looking at the calendar, if you, if you had it for action on the 13th of July, the planning board has a meeting on the 21st, uh, which is the, a week later plus a, plus a day, that they could, if you were fairly confident you were going to refer to the to, for the, to the planning board for review, they could have it on that agenda for that evening and then come back with a recommendation for council to have it in August. And then you could set a public hearing in September and then uh, final adoption in October. Of course, that is the cockeyed optimist talking at 10 past 10 on a, on a Monday night, but that is how the well, calendar was, breaks down. <laughs> what I was gonna say though, is I, I don't really think that there's any time drops between now and, and the two July meetings that you just talked about because um, we're, we're not going to have another workshop between now and um, 
you know, any other time here in June. So even I don't, I didn't have an expectation of coming out of tonight with this being ready to move in a vote on the 8th, Penny. I don't know if you did, but. I'm an eternal optimist. So. <laughs> I, I figured that this would take at least one more discussion. And it's going to uh, take at least two discussions or three at the planning board. That's okay. Let's go. I still, I still haven't had my uh, Tito's yet tonight. So <laughs> it's almost ten fifteen. So we'll plan for a July workshop. Is that what everybody wants to do, or? Okay. Fine. Yes. Yes. Okay. Seven o'clock, July sixth. <laughs> what day of the week is that? Monday. That's, the that's a Monday. Uh, I can't swear I'll make it, but sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> right after Fourth of July weekend. Yeah. You should be recovered by then, Councillor Straw. <laughs> <laughs> Too many hamburgers. Like, like I said, nobody's going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only thing to look forward to. Council meetings, yes. <laughs> okay, so everybody's going to come to that workshop with um, input, correct? We all have homework. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. The other, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wants to add any comment? Okay. Um, the only other having just agreed on that the only other thing though that i was just thinking of matt was and i don't know what else is scheduled for we, we do have an existing ordinance committee meeting scheduled on the 18th of june that oh, we could use yeah. we could use uh, it, a, again it doesn't it doesn't advance okay. us any further it, it you know we'd still be hitting the july agenda but if we I don't know if it accomplishes anything is the point, but it's a, it's an, a meeting we already have on the books. And I, I don't know what else is planned for that meeting, if anything. We have a, we have a guest speaker. Oh, right, from, yeah. From the uh, Cumberland County Conservation right. District, right? Yeah. Um, so we could, so we could knock that out of the way first and then, then go to this, Yeah. theoretically. Theoretically. What are, what are, what's everybody's thoughts about that? Yes? <laughs> are you Eighteenth. asking Penny and Chris or? No, everybody would come to the meeting is what, you know what I'm saying. Everybody would come to the ordinance meeting instead of having a workshop on the 6th. Mr. Oh, Mr. Chairman, I, have would you a, like to... I have a Fort Williams Park committee meeting that evening um, at six o'clock, but I, yeah, don't let. So the ordinance committee is not scheduled to start till seven. And if we have this other agenda item ahead of it, I'd be surprised if you, as long as you didn't mind playing a double header, uh, I'd be surprised if you couldn't make it. So, yep, Matt. Would you, would you like us to notice that as a uh, as a uh, town council workshop, we could have the ordinance committee and then uh, to be followed by a town council workshop. That's that what I'm. Yeah, that's sure what I'm suggesting. Probably notice. Yeah, yep, yeah, that's what I was suggesting. Okay. I think that's a great suggestion because it's fresh in everybody's mind rather than waiting till after okay. July fourth. Okay. So let's take that plan then. All right.
Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? You don't need one, Mr. Chairman. You're okay because it's a workshop. All right. Last call for anybody. <laughs> no. All right. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening.